Um, now, I'm very glad to introduce our speakers for today. Firstly, we have Dr. Kyril Ahmad, the Chief Executive Officer at the Centre. Dr. Kyril holds a PhD in Political Theory with deep research in Public Policy Analysis. The Centre, on the other hand, is a Malaysian think tank dedicated to centrist thought that was founded by our current Minister of Health, YB Kairi Jamaluddin and Shahril Hamdan, the Chief of Information for Amun. The Centre is, however, committed to non-partisan people-first research that is led by Dr. Kairi. Um, next on the esteemed panel for today, we have Juan Anita, the founder and president of the Mental Illness Awareness and Support Association, MIASA. MIASA is a mental health advocacy and peer support NGO that aims to promote awareness on the importance of mental health, address misconceptions on mental health issues, while providing support for peers and caregivers through its initiatives. Next, we have Dr. Ravi, a practicing psychiatrist at Hospital Miri, Sarawak. He's a member of the National Technical Working Group on Suicide Prevention, that I believe well, Juan Anita is a part of as well. And as a psychiatrist, he leads a suicide prevention-oriented clinical service. And besides clinical work, his areas of research include the role of media in suicide prevention, postvention services, and gatekeeper training, among others. Um, we have one more speaker that I think has not arrived just yet. Um, but our final speaker that completes our panel is Dr. Sharifa, the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Medicine of UKM. Dr. Sharifa is a professor of hospital management and health economics with her main interest in the areas of health policy and health inequality. Uh, Dr. Sharifa has also been appointed as a consultant to the Ministry of Human Resource, Ministry of Health, and the Prime Minister's Department on several occasions due to her expertise. So we're very grateful today to have four speakers from diverse backgrounds with immense experience in running think tanks and NGOs through academia, policymaking, advocacy, and even practicing clinical psychiatry. So I'm sure this is going to be an eye-opening and much needed discussion on the topic of decriminalizing suicide attempts. And beyond that, the prevention of suicide as a whole. So uh, before we go straight into the nitty gritty parts of our discussion for today, uh, it would be good to hear from each of the speakers uh, briefly on what your current role entails and how does your role or organization contribute to these efforts of suicide prevention in Malaysia? Um, is it okay if I pass it to Dr. Carroll first? Just, just start on this. Um, sure, Sura. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to MSGA for inviting uh, me, inviting the center to this uh, event. Uh, and also greetings to my fellow panelists, Dr. Ravi and Puan Anita. Um, so, um, one of the work that the center has been doing topics, but one of them that's um, um, <clears throat> uh, relevant to our that's relevant to our um, our session um, uh, or our topic today is um, our work on uh, our research on mental health, uh, which we have um, done in two rounds. So we started uh, uh, or we did a mental health uh, a research on uh, the mental well-being of uh, Malaysians uh, at the beginning of uh, the MCO um, last year. Uh, and we did another round of the research uh, a year uh, on after uh, the pandemic began uh, this year. So what we did was uh, we conducted uh, an in-depth survey among Malaysians uh, with the aim to understand the impact of the pandemic on their mental um, and physical well-being. Uh, the result um, isn't that surprising. Uh, many people uh, reported negative mental health state, but um, it was a reminder mental health issues. So that's um, the center's work on mental health, specifically um, uh, to the issue of suicide, um, suicide uh, or attempted suicide. We have taken a position that it should be decriminalized. Um, so that's where the center stands on uh, uh, on the specific topic that we're looking at um, um, today. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kyle. That's um really interesting research there. Um, and I think we can pick up more on it um, later when we talk about suicide prevention. 
Um, can I pass the floor to you, Juan Anita? Sure. Thank you very much, Sura. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon, everyone. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much to the Malaysian Students Global Alliance uh, for having me here today with my other uh, fellow panelists uh, and also for bringing forth uh, this very important topic uh, in conjunction with also Suicide uh, Prevention Day month uh, last month and also uh, moving towards World Mental Health Day and also World Mental Health Month. Um, so very, very happy to be part of this very important discussion. So just a little bit about um, YASA, the Mental Illness Awareness and Support Association, and also a little bit, um, Sura and everyone, uh, on the work that we do. So YASA is a mental health um, advocacy and peer support group. Um, so pretty much the work that we do is providing awareness um, on the importance of mental mental health, um, addressing misconceptions on mental health disorders, uh, which as we know, um, there is a huge stigma and I always call um, stigma is the true poison of it all uh, because from stigma, it leads to discrimination. And because of stigma, a lot of people do not reach out for the help. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of shame attached to a mental health disorder. What more, uh, those that are battling suicidal thoughts, ideation, contemplating suicide, um, those that have you know lost um, loved ones to suicide, uh, those that suffer addiction problems. So there's there's a lot there's a lot of work to be done, uh, and of course we also support um, our peers and also um, caregivers um, by providing you know life either livelihood support or relief support. And as much as possible, although we strive to be a one stop center, our main focus is on non medical alternatives because we focus on whole life approach. So when it comes to suicide prevention, um, intervention, there's a lot of different um, areas uh, in relation to suicide that Miasa works on. Uh, so one, uh, first and foremost, obviously, is awareness. Uh, we started works in 2016. Uh, in 2018, we were already on the front page of NSD. Um, for the first time, it made hard news. Uh, talking about decrim, um, how people that are battling suicidal thoughts and ideation who have ended lives. Um, the actual truth is they are crying out for help. It's not that they want to die. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, knowledge, insights during the time. So a lot of our peers um, shared their stories openly, those that have uh, attempted suicide in the past. Uh, so there were a lot of insights through that. So a lot of campaigns that we do is usually um, trying to encourage people to open up because many and most people that have gone through recovery are typically silenced due to stigma. Uh, we work a lot um, with the media. We create a lot of infographics. Uh, and when we talk, you know, when we speak about the topic of decrim, uh, we have championed this from day one. So stigma reduction, um, fighting for discrimination and the rights of peers uh, is something that uh, we continue to do and hopefully um, Till the end, uh, inshallah. So that's the vision and that is the goal of Miasa. Uh, social inclusion and hopefully uh, no one is left behind in this process. Thank you, Sura. Thank you so much, Pananita. And yeah, I think it's really exciting to hear about the work that Miasa is doing. And it also is really exciting to see this, like the different backgrounds that um, all of the oh, panelists are from. Yeah, so definitely. Yeah, because I'll be passing it on to Dr. Ravi now to give his perspective and also um, just his background. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sora, for inter uh, for inviting. I mean, for the whole team for inviting us, and also um, I'm quite thankful to be among this group of panelists who are quite diverse. Uh, what do I do? I I work as a psychiatrist. I work in clinical services and. Uh, in uh, MIRI, which is uh, one part of the bigger framework of our um, Ministry of Health Hospitals, which is uh, in a sense a national healthcare service, the largest healthcare service provider in the country. Uh, we are, uh, we pro uh, where I, in the unit that I work in, we provide inpatient, outpatient, uh, community-based mental health services, as well as uh, that comes both through community mental health center services, as well as uh, community psychiatry services and also we do a lot of prevention work and particularly we have our own uh, suicide prevention unit that runs within that um, that framework. Uh, I How I got into this work was as part of uh, somewhere down when I was training to be a psychiatrist 
I got involved in suicide prevention research and I've been there and since then. And there's been a lot of reasons why I still stay there. Uh, suicide prevention is a very, very big goal, a very, very huge um, endeavor that needs to be um, it needs to be not just done by one person or one organization, but requires the collaborative effort of many stakeholders. The causation of suicides are so complex. They do not just involve individual factors. They do involve a lot of social and systemic factors. And uh, so particularly uh, the decriminalization of suicide attempts is a very close uh, 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 it's a very close uh, end of all that's been, I think, shared with by almost all of us, all of us who are atten attending this uh, panel, uh, because we do believe that, you know, when systemic change comes, stigma goes off. I think uh, Juan Anita has spoken so much about stigma, I don't want to add on any further, but yes, and stigma and people start to reach out to get help and uh, this is one thing that this is something that can move the needle in suicide prevention in the country so that's about it thank you thank you so much Dr. Ravi. um now um just moving on from our introduction so we want to move into the crux of the issue for the day and we know as um, dr Ravi has mentioned and also as Juan Anita has mentioned that um Attempting suicide in Malaysia is chargeable as a criminal offence, and this is because of the existence of Section 309 of the Penal Code. And we have this slide up here so that um, the participants can also see what the section says word for word. So um, there are a couple of things that we'd like to unpack and um, about this section. So I'm going to leave it to the speakers to sort of pick up on the bits that they'd like to comment on. But firstly, what we'd want to look at is how did Section 309 of the Penal Code come to be? How is it relevant in this era? And what are its effects on suicide prevention? So um, I'll just pass it on to whoever would like to comment first. But generally, these are the sort of different points that we'd want to discuss about this. Thank you, Dr. Um, I, I can go first, Sura. It's okay. <laughs> yes, that's perfectly okay. It's okay with Dr. Ravi and Pananita as well. Uh, Go ahead. Just, just to just to lay the groundwork lah for the discussion, right? <laughs> yes. Thank uh, you, Dr. Karen. <laughs> Section three hundred nine is actually uh, it's it's uh, a part of our penal code that um, was enacted uh, during the British colonial period, um, and it originated from uh, the Indian Penal Code, which is also based on, of course. Uh, um, uh, British common law. La. So that's, um, um, uh, in short, um, <clears throat> the, the uh, origin of, of this uh, section. And uh, where Malaysia is not the only um, country with um, uh, <clears throat> uh, this section or a section that's similar uh, in, it, in, in the penal code, it's just that um, a number of countries have moved to Uh, bar, I think about 20 countries. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, um, these are former British colonies themselves. Most of them, if not all, um, um, countries that are still keeping it includes um, Nigeria, Bangladesh, um, Malawi, um, closer to, to home, Brunei as well. Uh, but I mentioned earlier that, uh, and I think we'll be covering this as well uh, in this uh, session, right? Um, some countries that have inherited this code have also moved away from it. Um, Singapore, for example, last year um, decriminalized uh, attempted suicide. So that's uh, uh, so that's the the story lah about Section three hundred nine. Can leave it to I'll leave it to Dr. Ravi and Bonanita as well to comment. Yep. Um, it's a sort of like an inheritance that we have got. Our penal code comes from the uh, Indian penal code that comes from the British common law, and that's how it is. And if you do look, the numbers are also similar to when you look at, you know, 309. Why is it 3? Why is it 0? Why is it 9? And you can see that in order and all of that. You can also see quite a lot of similarities uh, that go across. And I think um, 
as what uh, Dr. Kyrill kindly mentioned, it's a sort of thing that you see in former British colonies and all of that. And we do look at uh, many, um, that when we inherit laws, that you inherit a huge set of laws. You don't just inherit pre-09. You, you, when you take the penal code, you get all of it. Yeah, and some of it stays behind and, you know, and goes on with that. And with the inheritance that doesn't come with it, it doesn't come, unfortunately, I may, uh, sorry if I do some, do seem to take it as a, take, it, take this very serious situation in a little bit of a lighthearted fashion, but I think this is important for the audience to understand. This is not like a Microsoft purchase where if you get it, you get your updates. Like if the current, if the original place has removed, that update comes to wherever that is, it doesn't. You get the law, you deal with the law. Uh, if that so if you look at it now and you go back to laws that you are seeing in India you're seeing in, in the UK where you see where these took root from they're, they're already no longer there things have changed so yeah you don't get that update coming in that way it is up to the country to move on with that so yeah that's that okay um thank you very much uh, Dr. Ravi and uh, Dr. Kyril um Sura if I may add okay uh, there's a couple of things that I want to just point out via this uh, section 309 of the penal code. Um, I think people that know Miyasa, um, they know that we very much, you know, talk a lot about stigma. So by having, um, you know, this code um, or decriminalization of suicidal attempts still um, relevant um, today, if, if this is the case, then uh, it really reinforces stigma for a couple of reasons, right? So firstly, uh, we are treating the person that is ill, the person that is already in a lot of pain, um, excruciating psychological pain. Um, you know, the thought process of a person that goes through suicidal thoughts, ideation, um, it's closed in that sense, hence why they need a lot of help. Um, so what happens um, is when they attempt, um, they will, um, tr strive to use a method that is lethal, because if you do not die, you know what's going to happen. You're going to go to prison. You get penalized. Um, you know people will stigma stigmatize you. You're going to be discriminated. There's going to be a lot of labels. You're going to go, you're going to be shamed. You know so there's a lot of stigma. Um, if this law is still uh, in place, it doesn't address um, the issue root causes of why the person has uh, the condition or is battling uh, suicide in the first place. Um, so I think that there is a lot of harm um, if we continue to, to decrim, but obviously decriminalizing it isn't the only, um, you know, strategy in preventing suicide, but it is one off. And I think that if we decrim, there's a lot of positive things that can come out uh, via this. So very much um, Miasa and, you know, a lot of uh, the different stakeholders, um, NGOs on the ground, you know, mental health professionals, very much um, as a collective effort voice uh, would like to push for this amendment. Um, thank you so much uh, to all three. Um, so something that we want to pick up on on this um, section 309 and penal code as well, that I think was brought up on Saido as well, is that um, how frequently is it actually enforced? So we know that this law exists, but are people actually getting charged by it? Or what is actually happening here? Dr. Ravi, please. I was thinking Dr. Kairal is going to give an answer first. Are you going to give an answer? <laughs> uh, no, no, go ahead, please. Uh, well, I'm just going to quote what's available publicly. Um, what we know is that what we don't know, let's start with what we don't know. It's good to know what we don't know, then I'll tell you a bit of what we know. So it's a little bit of a sobering fact. What we don't know is when and how this law is used. We do not have much uh, written and published evidence on that. Um, and recently, this was a question that was asked in the parliament. And so the answer was given in the, and it can be reviewed very publicly in the Hansard. Uh, the reason Hansard, I, if I am not mistaken, 21st September, you can just go to the Parliament's website and look at the Hansard and the number that was cited for 2018 to June 2021, if I am not mistaken, I'm, I could be very wrong here, is about 902 cases. So uh, we're not sure whether they're all charged, they start with charge and they end with a prosecution or uh, really, you know, whether they get uh, fined or whether they get imprisoned or whether they uh, are sent... Um, are they, are, whether they are acquitted, we don't know, but 902 was a number that was 
reported in the parliament. So I'm just merely stating facts that are available in public domain here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, maybe I can add to what Dr. Ravi just shared. Okay, um, from the work that we do, um, obviously, you know, we deal with, especially uh, being in this whole pandemic hit, a lot of people, well, suicide risks have increased. So obviously, a lot of people are battling uh, su suicidal thoughts, ideation, uh, behaviors. Um, and from what has happened, um, you know, when we send people to uh, emergency, um, as much as possible, what we do is, as a, as, as a strategy, um, although they, um, you know, reveal that they would like to attempt um, or they are in, you know, that situation, uh, when we bring them to, to the emergency, sometimes depending on the situation, we don't really reveal it. Mm -hmm. Just because we want them to get the help that they need, right, immediately. Um, so that's one. Um, two, what we've seen is um, there is more help today um, from let's say three, four years ago. Um, so that means there's more awareness. Um, so if someone does attempt, then they get the help that they need immediately. Um, uh, before, uh, what we've seen is, um, you know, they get, um, either they go to the police station immediately, you know, they get reported, um, you know, there's other things that happens. But now, today, we've seen that improved. Um, a lot of people, um, various stakeholders are more um, knowledgeable, are more well-versed that, you know, it's not necessary. It's more of a mental health issue. I think now, or, or a mental health disorder, uh, I, I see that shift today. So because of that, more are uh, getting the help that they need and they're not treated, you know, as a criminal uh, in that sense. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Sanita. Um, just to pick up on something you mentioned, so when you do actually bring them into, let's say, the emergency department, if you were to reveal that, um, you know, they may have gone through suicidal episodes or they may have attempted suicide, is that actually a risk of them being charged immediately? Um, okay, there's two things that can happen. Um, if we make the call, the police will come. And that's not something that that, uh, that I want to, I don't want that to happen, um, um, Sura, uh, because, you know, the person is already in, in crisis. Um, you know, there's a lot of hopelessness. Um, the person doesn't see a way out during that time, right? During that instant. Um, mm -hmm. So I really, we really don't want to go ahead and make that call because then the ambulance comes, the police will come at the same time because the report is uh, an attempt, right? Um, mm -hmm. So because of that, um, we try as much as possible not to have uh, the police involved um, in it because then there's, you know, there's stigma, there is a chance that maybe, you know, um, they will get punished uh, because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, um, Dr. Ravi, just to like um, bring you back in on this. So in that case, if then, um, like, you know, people are being brought to the emergency department and it isn't being made clear that, you know, that they've attempted suicide because now there's this risk of them being arrested, does that actually change the way you would treat them or does that affect the whole, um, the whole treatment procedures that you would put them through? I guess uh, here's where it's quite important to look into uh, what is the question here. Mm, sorry, I'm hearing an echo. Uh, uh, well, uh, whatever said and done, uh, we do, uh, however a client comes to us through whatever pathway or a patient comes to us from regardless the pathway for treatment, I think the goal will be treatment and the person's, and the person's needs are looked after. Um, um, it also, again, comes to the part where I, I can't really say how, um, I would not say that the, the presence or absence of a person having a 309 charge would defer the process of treatment if a person needs care inpatient or person needs care outpatient, person needs care wherever they need and what, they, what we work with the person, that's how we do with it. it uh, from At least on the clinician's perspective, uh, we don't. And uh, I think that's a, a code of ethics as well, regardless whatever charge a person carries, and that includes other charges as well. Our, we, do, uh, we, do, we do treat the person the same way. I mean, I mean at least as part of the mental health professional's perspective, at least. So it doesn't change the fact, but, but I would like to hold on to your question in the sense that 
if someone is charged and not brought to healthcare facilities, what could actually happen is that the there is could be delay in treatment where a person is kept in, uh, where a person, we are invoking 309 or any kind of charge under the penal code, which is, which is, uh, which you will, which technically what happens if you have a charge, a police charge, you have to go to the police station and give uh, the whole process there that delays that person from coming to a health center. So that's number one. And we need to now mm -hmm. look back at facts and look back at uh, what we know and evidence. And one thing that is in the risk factors for suicide is a previous suicide attempt. So if the person that you are moving here and there and the person who's not reaching the healthcare center is already at risk of suicide again. So there you are looking and you're bringing the person to a place that is possibly stressful. So that is another point that can actually worsen outcomes in terms, in the terms that you are increasing suicidal risk. So that's my perspective on that. Um, we prefer people to be, I mean, uh, when you are in a crisis, you go to where you'll help your crises to be alleviated. A person in crises needs to get help and help needs to be provided in a way that people need it. Um, we can have this discussion on crisis care somewhere down the line, but um, needless to say, uh, it's important that we don't delay the help that people get. So I hope my answer comes across that way. Yep. Thank you so much, Ravi. And um, Dr. Carrier, you uh, no, just just to very quickly, uh, I'm not. I don't think I'm gonna add any um, anything um, new um, to what Bonanita and Dr. Ravi has said, right? But just to go back to the question on relevance, right? So we see and and to pick up Bonanita's um, point on the shift, right? That we've 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 seen in terms of how um, how we look at um, mental health issues uh, from say a point when uh, mental health um, was not necessarily seen as important as physical where you have um, practitioners and clinicians like Bonanita and Dr. Ravi, right? Um, 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 really sort of uh, looking into how treatments and how help can be given uh, to anyone at all. Uh, you have that, right? You have this, what we're seeing here now, but you also have, on the other hand, still the law. So it, it, it begs the question, right, uh, on, on this issue of relevance. Uh, it, why, why do we still need it? And um, um, how does it help with anything, right? Just also to, 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 echo, with, uh, to echo what Dr. Ravi has said. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, uh, because of the position that we have taken in the center, then of course we think that it's not relevant anymore. But at the same time, um, we're also quite, um, whenever we do research, we're also quite, um, um, we're also interested to understand the complexities behind probably um, something that's really interesting to be looked into. Um, so we're talking, if we're talking about um, the level of where, you know, where we have, clin we have clinicians, we have practitioners who are very much um, involved, right, in the issue. Um, but you also have, um, uh, you also have the general public uh, mm -hmm. and um, you've got to ask questions like, you know, what kind of, what kind of, um, uh, what kind of, um, uh, views do people hold when it comes to issues um, such as um, suicide, right? And how would people actually react to proposals to, for example, repeal or amend um, the law, right? Uh, and that then would also map onto how lawmakers then see, <laughs> in terms of the, in in terms of you know we're 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 still we're, we're very much uh, 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 we've got. The seats, if they're already in parliament, would definitely want to understand or want to see uh, what the mood is like when proposals such as this are uh, being put forward. I was mentioning to Sura before the session earlier, right? Um, uh, on the surface, it actually looks like the issue of decriminalizing suicide attempt um, would not 
necessarily be something that's as controversial, for example, as say something that we've discussed for the past couple of years, right? Um, um, repealing the death penalty, for example. It's probably a little bit more highly charged, um, but at the same time, um, I suppose there are a lot of complexities at the societal level when it comes to issues uh, and topics such as suicide. Right? Um, yeah, um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kyle. Uh, that's something that we'll definitely like dive deeper um, later on in the session. But yeah, I think um, the really helpful analogy that Dr. Ravi gave earlier about Microsoft Office and how we didn't really get the updates kind of ties back to this idea of relevancy, right? Um, and how we kind of just stuck with what has been given. Um, but moving forward from this, so we already we've addressed this idea that okay, Section three zero nine um causes a lot of problems and it has its detrimental effects on suicide prevention but um there have been some um steps that have been taken to reduce this effect or rather to circumvent the effects of section 309 um could i get the next slide please so the ministry of health introduced the mental health act 2001 together with specific regulations um in the mental health regulations 2010 um, and these are the wording on the screen, so which were seen as a significant turning point for mental health care in Malaysia, as it contains detailed policy guidelines for the delivery of services. The Act also consolidates the law in relation to mental disorders and provides procedures for admission, detention, lodging, care, treatment, and rehabilitation. So um, this is Section 11 of the Mental Health Act. And um, this part specifically outlines the proceedings of apprehending mentally disordered persons. Um, I'd like to bring your attention to part two that basically says that the police officer or social welfare officer who has apprehended a person under subsection one shall as soon as practicable, but not later than 24 hours after the apprehension, bring the person to a medical officer in a government psychiatric hospital or registered medical practitioner in a gazetted private psychiatric hospital for examination. So um, I'd like to open up this discussion now um, on what, what is the background or what is the intent of this act, first of all, and how effective has it been in preventing suicide? Um, as someone who works, unfortunately, with the Mental Health Act very, very often, uh, so that's part of my work, I would like to talk about there is, um, people do like Section 11, people do like to focus on Section 11 and, you know, those sections, but let's, I think this is something Juan Anita might agree with me, there is a need to understand this very important statement the most important stakeholder for suicide prevention is the suicidal person themselves. People are their best vessels of getting recovery, best vessels of getting well, getting out of a crisis. So the Mental Health Act also has another part which helps people go into services voluntarily for inpatient care. The Mental Health Act generally dwells in inpatient care where a lot of the laws are there that deal with people being put into, or people being staying in psychiatry facilities. There is a reason why mental health acts exist across the world. Um, these, I mean, it should of course encompass a lot more than outside uh, outpatient care, community care. Yes, our mental health act also does that, but a lot of the more tough, uh, more uh, stringently worded, as well as more uh, carefully need to be, uh, what we call careful interpretations need to be taken care into the inpatient care. So in Malaysia, there's two pathways of inpatient, uh, there are a few pathways. I'm just gonna focus on the important bits. There's the voluntary inpatient pathway where people want to get admitted and go, uh, go in voluntary as well. And that's probably because when you are in a crisis and in a situation where uh, being at home and, and we do need to know suicidal crises are so diverse, it could be a part where it happens due to a life, the triggering factor could be a life crisis on a background of so many things. It could be a severe depressive illness, there could be even psychosis, so many things. Some people have the capacity to make decisions, some people do not have the capacity to make decisions. It's very, it's like, um, it's unfortunately for discussions, we tend to put the suicidal person in one box 
they're not one box. There are so many different types of people with different capacities. Some people who want to go in voluntarily, they go in voluntarily, they go and get the help that they need. They come in. We still get so many people who just come in saying that I'm suffering from suicidal thoughts. I need help. There are a good number. And as Juan Anita said, with the number of services increasing and the stigma reducing and all the awareness activities going about, people are getting help. That's important to note. And it's important if we hold on to that thought because globally, suicide rates have come down. We started in 2012 with 800,000 people dying, more than 800,000 people dying by suicide. Now we are at uh, the 2019 statistics is 700,000 people are dying by suicide and the global population has increased. So it looks like there's something going on where people can actually get help on themselves. But this particular sections actually do where police officers and social welfare officers are there to help those people who cannot help themselves. Those who are unfortunately due to the uh, duress, lost capacity or do or the inability to make decisions because they are in such a distressed state. There are so many reasons why people can be having that. And that's where Section 11 comes in. Uh, it is very important that I here also acknowledge the role of the police and real, acknowledge the role of the social welfare officers. Uh, we, nowhere on earth, can we run a mental health act without the collaboration and support that we get from our men in uniform, especially the police and the firemen? Because some people, when they are very, very unwell, they become very dangerous to themselves and are in very dangerous situations where services um, like the health service or even peer led services, or you know, you can't reach them because they're at such great risk. You might need assistance that the police force may be able to offer, including uh, rescuing people from very dangerous places. So these are things that you really need to see that. And Section 11 has been helpful, especially when someone is found alone who does not have capacity to go back on his own or there's no, actually we don't know and we need the person to be uh, managed. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I do not like to. Uh, uh, I do not like to say they need to be managed. They need to because people are people. They have their own volition. Uh, the people who might need care in an inpatient facility. This is where, when you actually don't have any other people, this is where the Section Eleven comes in very handy. And uh, there are certain safeguards again with the Mental Health Act. Decisions of involuntary treatment, which is where we're coming, are often made more than one person. And that's why you have that clause, uh, 24 hours of apprehension. The police can apprehend and bring the person to the uh, emergency department or bring them for assessment, but it does not equate to direct detention. Or through this, they don't also don't go into the police. Using Section 11, you don't go into the police station either. You don't also go automatically into a psychiatry ward. You don't get forcefully go uh, be put in some place. That's very important because of the history mm -hmm. of abuses towards people with mental health problems, where people, where when you don't agree with someone in the past, people have been put in asylums in a really, really unfortunate situation. And that's why we have these mental health acts across the world, these mental health acts across the world. So more than one person makes a decision. So someone mm -hmm. comes, a police brings someone in. And now uh, what happens next is um, they are assessed and using section 11, they're probably assessed by a doctor. And after the person is assessed by a doctor with the police report, you need to have both. All right, the Paul 57 and this, that particular form that police fill up for this, and then they get admitted. Or social worker, they bring a cover letter and the assessment by the doctor. You go into the psychiatry ward for a period of only 24 hours before you are examined by an independent psychiatrist. The psychiatrist thinks whether you can actually stay or leave. It's really important that these timelines, and there's a lot of other timelines that you will see in the Mental Health Act, 24 hours, one month, one month involuntary stay, three months involuntary stay. There's a lot of people that are involved in the decision making, and there is an appellate process as well. Let's say you feel that you're wrongly put in detention, you can fill out something called a Form 10 application to have it also assessed. So it's mm -hmm. important that these systems are known so that we don't see the Mental Health Act from a very, um, from a lens, from one view only, it's much more complex than that. I hope I did not end up confusing everybody by saying that, but it's important to know that there's more than that. This law certainly does help. It brings people who are not capable of making decisions, and there are that subset of people. This helps that subset of people. And also something that the Mental Health Act helps, which is not in Section 11, is the voluntary part of it. All right? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. Um, on Anita? 
there's there's a there's a lot of thoughts um there are a lot of thoughts actually to be honest um when it comes to this um first and foremost I'm a person with lived experience. Um, you know, Miasa, the majority of us are people with lived experience. And so when we look at the Mental Health Act, although, um, you know, the intention of having the Mental Health Act, uh, there's a couple. So we want to provide, um, you know, private hospitals or, 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 or nursing home centers. We want to expand community uh, mental services, uh, reduction of beds, uh, probably in mental health institutions. Um, we want to provide help as soon as possible, um, like what Dr. Ravi was saying, uh, for those that, you know, are, um, have attempted suicide, for example, right? There is an issue when we talk about this because um, I believe that coming from a person with lived experience that anyone in any point of time, whatever severity of a condition should come to an informed consent, um, to an informed decision. Um, so I do not wish to provide any involuntary um, you know, treatment, admission, and I totally understand where we're coming from because uh, when there is poor mental health literacy, obviously people do not get the help early. And because of this, your condition then becomes severe, right? And then when, you know, you battle, you contemplate, you attempt, uh, you come to the extreme end, um, you know, we don't have enough resources and this is where we need um, the people in uniform, like what Dr. Ravi said, to help out. Um, but in, in, in reality, I'm really hoping that for Malaysia, um, if we can expand community mental services, if we can have the resources where we have time to really, um, you know, speak, um, talk it out to the person that is in crisis, uh, that in itself can actually help to save a life. Um, if we look at many models, um, outside of Malaysia, obviously, just give you an example really quickly, is Trieste. So what has happened in Trieste uh, in 1970s, they actually closed down uh, mental institutions and they expanded community mental services. Obviously, in the beginning, you would expand, um, you would invest a lot. So you double the money, uh, there's a lot of investment money um, needed. But uh, eventually what will happen is uh, you expand community mental services, 24 seven, a lot of people will get the help earlier. Um, and what has happened in the past 20 years in Trieste, the suicide ratio has declined by 50%, five zero, um, and it continues to decline. So from here, you can see from this model and many models across the world that by expanding community mental services, making it available, um, you know, having all the different um, help and resources, a lot, it can actually be prevented. Um, so I'm really hoping that, you know, in Malaysia, we will move towards that um, because one, we don't have a sustainable model. We all know this. Mm -hmm. So people get the help that they need. Um, and then what happens is because there's not a sustainable model, they, you know, now don't have a job, especially when caregivers die, they don't have a place mm -hmm. to go. Uh, they end up on the streets and then uh, they relapse or recur recurrence of episodes happen. And this is where, you know, um, they then battle suicidal uh, behaviors. Um, so I'm really hoping that now with the whole pandemic, um, you know, reinvest, um, no, sorry, investment um, mm -hmm. in mental health, prioritization in mental health happens and um, redistributing the existing resources happens as well. So whichever, you know, components, areas that probably are not moving fast enough or, you know, not quite working, uh, let's reinvest um, and, you know, use it. Um, and also strengthening um, the resources that we have um, currently. Mm -hmm. I think if we do that, um, there's a lot of things that can actually improve um, Sura and also task shifting uh, because task shifting has really um, proven um, to help uh, you know, a, a lot of people across the globe. So for example, if we provide a little bit of training um, to the volunteers, to first responders, for example, then you know every person can become a resource. We engage the community, mm -hmm. right? Because outside is everyone's business. And when a lot of people become resource, they know what to do, then suicide can be prevented um, at that level, individual, family, and community as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. So this is actually my hope uh, for Malaysia. Thank you so much, Pananuta, especially for the lived experience impact, because I think 
that really brings a different different yep. conversation. Yeah, because I think um, sometimes sometimes when we look at a person that is in crisis, we feel that they yeah. can't really think well. But if you take the time to really talk to the person, and not I'm not saying thirty minutes an hour, it could probably be hours. They can eventually reach an informed decision. And and I know we don't have the resources, but if we're able to do that, um, then we can prevent you know, all these other things from happening, surely, mm -hmm. because other countries can do it, why not us? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'd just like to also just quickly uh, welcome Dr. Sharifa. Hello. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, yeah, you, thank you very you much. Um, yeah, so uh, Dr. Sharif uh, is currently the deputy dean in UCM, and um, she's a professor in hospital management and health. No. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Sura. I'm, yeah. I'm, I apologize for uh, my late uh, coming. Oh, no, it's okay. um, no uh, I, I just want to say that uh, from a public health perspective, I'm not a, a psychiatrist, and I really welcome Dr. Ravi's input just now and um, mm. Ms. Anita and our friends, uh, Cik Khairi. Eh? I think mm. from a public health perspective, eh, um, the burden of not only suicide, eh, uh, in general, it's mental health illness, because most of this suicide, correctly pointed out by Dr. Ravi, is not on its own. You don't suddenly want to die. There must be some other factors or triggers that actually push the patient or, or the person into a suicidal attempt. And this is usually manifested again with some sort of depression, some sort of anxiety, some sort of stressful uh, traumatic event and things like that. And we can see that this is happening very, very markedly during the pandemic, um, this pandemic. Um, there's a lot of calls um, for, for befrienders and people coming in and saying that I'm under stress and under duress and what do I do and things like that. It's not to the extent that some of them are not to the extent that they might want to commit suicide, but some of them do have some suicidal intention, not to the extent of actually um, cutting themselves or hanging themselves. But these mm. are things that we really need on the public health perspective. These are really things that we need to detect early, but also mm. prevent. The, the issue is that, do we have enough resources to do that? Like what Ms. Anita is saying, that we don't have enough resources. Um, there are not many trained people um, trying to do, even the first, first aid, so-called the uh, psychological first aid, even for simple psychological first aid, there's not enough people and this happens mm. worldwide and also in Malaysia. What is saddening to see is that um, this pandemic has gone even for your younger age. So you see adolescents and students having this problem as well. They may come from a uh, established family. They might not come from established family saying that, you know, they might have some financial burden uh, during the pandemic. Um, usually these are segregated from their family members. They don't have enough support. So when we say support, what does support mean? There's a lot of things the support it can be financial support it can be psychological support it can be support in other matters as well it can just be a friend listening in so there's a lot of things under support but do we have them at this point in time this is a breaking point for malaysia mm -hmm. as a whole not only economically but also doing mental stress and we and mental stress and duress we keep saying that you know we need to empower people but have we done enough we we, we have mm -hmm. not eh? we have not we have not increased our manpower our ratio of maybe psychologists and psychiatrists to the population <laughs> And this happens during the, if for, if for even children, eh, uh, Sura, mm -hmm. uh, what is distressing? Eh? Uh, we did some studies, prior studies, looking at, you know, things like smoking and vaping. And we look at uh, some of the things under, you know, a simple uh, psychological assessment like stress, anxiety. And this, uh, among the university students, and some of them are very young uh, still, and they are, we, we see there's a lot of problems. And this leads to other social problems as well. Things like smoking, um, you know, they may vape, they may go into other social ills as well. So there's a lot of correlation between men, so-called mental illness and also other social factors. And also in the end, they manifest into some ill beings, you know, they might go into drugs, they might be very dependent on, example, nicotine or drugs and things like that. So. So having said that, um, it is not an easy task having a, a penal code uh, like like you know you, you basically you criminalize someone who wants to commit suicide. Um, this is basically pushing people away. We need mm -hmm. people to not only people the community needs to be aware, but we need to come close to these um, so-called victims. Um, the issue is that 
um, stigmatization. Um, you mm. you you come in and you say you want to see either psychologist or psychiatrist. The first people that's gonna run away is your is your family members and your friends. Okay, then they say mm. that okay, you you're having some sort of cuckoo problem and things like that. So this stigmatization. How do we destigmatize this this issue? So this has to come forward. It has to be pushed not only by the NGOs but also from the government. And we need to understand this is a problem in Malaysia. Our National Health Mobility Survey keeps coming up with an uh, increasing number of mental duress for, for Malaysians as well. And it, the, yeah. like I mentioned, the age is getting younger as well. So we, we need to be really tactful in managing this um, because we, we have a double burden. Not only are we having problems with infectious diseases, things like COVID, dengue, which is like endemic, so-called endemic in Malaysia now, but we also have other, the other burden, which is also non-communicable diseases including our mental health problems. Yeah. So, so I think this sort of uh, discussions are very timely and I, I congratulate the organizers and also the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. And thank you for your input on um, the mental health support fees listing. But we're going to dive deeper into that right before the session ends and I'd love to hear more about it. Um, and just to sort of sum up what the panel has mentioned is that we have this section in this penal code and we have this mental health act, but due to the existence of this multiple pathways, um, correct me if I miss uh, quote you, Dr. Ravi, but the existence of this multiple pathways can lead to certain issues, right? And this may lead to, uh, this um, may end up increasing stress because of the way that people are pushed through the system. And this may end up to relapsing as well. Is that right? Yep, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that this is a systemic problem and not one yeah. that sits with the healthcare professional. It's not the people. Yep. So it's really important to, um, we should take any blame off anybody. We, I, yep. I always find that the, the um, social welfare officers, the police officers, the uh, members of the public, the family members, the persons and you know, the healthcare professionals all only are trying to do their job. And trying to do their job in the way uh, they're most, um, how do we say, they can do. But it, when you have a few laws that sit in, and this was something that came about when we, when we, when we found, when we were trying to investigate who actually goes, I mean, a research, actually a research question, who goes in here, who doesn't go in here. Technically, mm -hmm. there is really no real answer to it. There's, there are multiple pathways as well. There are people, okay, mm -hmm. after a suicidal attempt, um, when I attempted to summarize this and uh, for a poster recently, um, you can either choose not to get help. Okay, that happens. Mm -hmm. You can get help on your own voluntarily or your family can bring you to the hospital or to any clinic or to health facilities. You could be someone who is brought in by social welfare or police that also goes to that Section 11 pathway of Mental Health Act. And you can also be charged under Section 309 and you know, you don't, that, 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 that leads to a very complicated pathway where you get in remand, you get charged, then you go into court trial, and then suddenly in the court trial, you are found that you can't even make a case because unfortunately your mental state is so, uh, so affected, you um, could be someone who does not have a fitness to plea and then, or even be able to assume criminal responsibility. You're supposed, in order for you to be charged a crime, you must be able to be responsible to be charged for a crime. Mm -hmm. So that's when, I, when those questions happen, then they get channeled into the forensic pathway. And then, uh, you know, they assess to see whether they can take that responsibility or be able to plea and go into court. And then th that's one subset. And then there are these people, and then some people are freed, some people are stuck, are stuck in the system. And those initial two other pathways also, in somewhere down the line, if somebody decides to put a case on them, then the police have to act because there mm. is a section. So you see, again, um, this is about, and we cannot, I mean, I with my engage with our work, when we did with engagement with people, it's very it's very uh, it's it's very murky that place where you go mm -hmm. and say who's supposed to use what and all of that 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 murkiness exists. So there is this sort of uh, this uh, all this is a situation where not all roads lead to Rome. Some of them lead you somewhere totally different, and uh, and the pathway is unfortunate. Uh, the fortunate thing that when I see in clinical service, most of my patients do not at all. I mean. Do not at all get. Uh, it, it depends as well. Uh, my the ones you see in hospital, those people who are in the healthcare service, they they don't even brush with three zero nine. 
They go yeah. in and they get the help they need and so on and so forth. The people who actually brush with 309, unfortunately, become very hidden from services because uh, once you get charged, it's very hard to admit even suicidal thoughts again. And as, as I think yeah. that was echoed by our panelists earlier. So that's my thoughts on this. Mm, these multiple kind of ways of going in. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. Um, I think now, um, since we kind of highlighted all of these different issues or how it actually is detrimental to suicide prevention, um, I'd like to, uh, could you go to the previous slide? So I think now what we want to look at is we know how badly Section 309 has affected our nation's suicide prevention efforts and the effect that it has on relapsing. And one, uh, Anita mentioned something really interesting earlier, how it actually pushes victims to use more lethal methods so that they're not put through this. And um, it also prevents victims from receiving the care that they need. So now the question exists and the question remains, um, why does Section 309 still exist? And this is something that uh, Dr. Kyril Yu touched on as well, the, complete, the complexity of the whole issue. And I'd like to set this on the backdrop that Malaysia is just one of three ASEAN countries that actively criminalize suicide alongside Brunei and Myanmar. So I'd just like to open it back up to the floor. Um, Dr. Kyril, would you like to start this? Um, yes. Um... I think um, to answer that question directly would, would be to speculate a lot, lah, right? Uh, why does it still exist? But uh, what's what's uh, true is that um, the um, the question of before has been discussed. Um, Twenty twelve, for example, there was a discussion. Um, to make do with this uh, section, uh, I think 2019 uh, under the um, uh, Pakatan Harapan government, there was also this discussion, right, to uh, to repeal uh, 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 the section. But I don't think there was any follow up uh, on that. Um, and more recently, there there's also the mention of this uh, in Parliament. Um, but um, Why why it still exists, I think, uh, is something that is um, I, I'm not clear of um, because uh, if you want to talk about process, uh, repealing uh, a penal code section, I believe, requires um, a simple majority in parliament. So it can be taken to parliament uh, and be tabled uh, and uh, it can be sort of um, be voted on. It would, what would be interesting uh, is that if we could find out, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, what the public generally feel about um, the topic uh, and whether or not the public um, uh, in, 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 in a big number would actually or have actually um, uh, or have the appetite to discuss uh, the decriminalization or uh, the, re the repeal of this law. And that would, I guess that would be the more political angle uh, to the discussion, right? Um, but in terms of appetite amongst lawmakers uh, and people um, uh, in the policy making, um, people who occupy um, a policy making sort of positions, uh, the discussion is always there. Um, but it would be uh, interesting to know where you know you put you put on the table uh, mm. this option to um, move away, repeal or amend uh, this section. Um, we mentioned Singapore earlier, right? Singapore repealed it last year, and I remember the discussion in mm. uh, the, the the debate in in Singapore Parliament was. Um, uh, uh, also contained um, uh, voices that were hesitant uh, yeah. to actually make do with uh, with with the law, right? Uh, for a variety of reasons, one of it was, I believe, um, this argument that without the law, then you you can't actually um, know how many suicide attempts there's been, 
for example. Uh, or there's, there's also this argument that, well, you repeal this, then it might be a slippery slope. You know, people, uh, you might actually see uh, increase in suicide cases, which hasn't happened in Singapore, actually. Uh, suicide uh, rates have gone down. Um, so um, it would be interesting, I think, but um, who would come out and say, well, I don't think that it should be, um, uh, the law should be um, repealed. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, to know the reason as to why uh, this is the case. Um, because um, perhaps uh, traditional um, cultural values still very much shape the way people see yeah. um, this kind of thing, right? I mean, um, some somebody may not necessarily be too strongly against um, taking it away, but they may actually ask us, well, but what's the point to this, right? Isn't this yeah. cumbersome? Why not just leave it there and think of other ways to actually help um, people with mental health issues? Mm. Um, so the question would be then, how would you answer to that, right? Um, why are you so focused on uh, repealing the law? Why are we not talking about ways to just deal with the reality that we have it? And mental health um, um, services. Mm. Um, so there's also this position that um, you can actually maintain um, both sort of um, approaches um, in parallel, right? You have the law, the law's there, why do you want to do anything about it, right? Mm. And then by the same time, of course we think, or of course I think that you need, uh, you need strong sort of mental health support, um, which is very important. Um, so that's also another position that we, we may want to uh, think about. Also, perhaps, again, this is, quite speculative, right? But perhaps um, when it comes to priorities amongst lawmakers, uh, this may not necessarily be a topic that's quite high up on the list. Um, mm -hmm. That could also be the case. Um, but again, that's, that's it's just pure speculation from me. Uh, perhaps, you know, um, given the limited number of times um, our MPs actually meet in parliament, appetite or even if there's desire to, 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 to do something about it, right? But having said that, yeah. uh, the 12 Malaysia plan that was just announced this week uh, um, actually uh, did mention um, suicide um, uh, as part of um, as part of I think team two um, mm -hmm. on um, healthcare reform. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, so there's, there's this uh, section where um, the 12th MP document mentioned um, improving, um, improving services, uh, looking into more, um, looking into doing a better job in terms of preventing, um, um, uh, preventing um, health problems uh, that uh, would also include mental health um, yeah. as well. And also, and I think we're going to do this as well later, and also uh, establishing a suicide, um, national suicide registry. Mm -hmm. uh, but an interesting thing, uh, interesting to look into, lah, because yeah. we do have one already, but it's just inactive, right? Um, so, um, so I think, I think it's, it would be interesting to, 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 to take a deep dive into knowing, yeah. um, you know, to just float this question to um, um, uh, people at large, right? To ask mm. what they actually think about this and what kind of, what kind of uh, values or what kind of, um, what kind of um, um, concerns that actually would drive the way they respond um, to the question uh, as to whether or not this law that still criminalizes suicide attempts uh, should go away, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I think you'll find uh, a, a whole spectrum of responses uh, and, and quite complex responses as well, because it may be that, like I said earlier, um, in moral crime in many sort of faith systems, or belief systems, 
uh, people may not necessarily see this as something that's important, not because they are not empathetic to people who have mental health issues, but perhaps they would articulate their view in a different way. Um, so yeah. it's not really like yes or no, right? Um, it could be something more complex than that. And it yeah. will be up to our policymakers and especially lawmakers to sit down and um, um, trash the issue out lah amongst themselves. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, there's across parties in parliament, there are supporters of uh, um, this idea to um, repeal or amend uh, Section 309. Uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's of course, uh, um, COVID, the pandemic itself has basically laid bare lah, the, you know, the, 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 the deficiencies, if, if, you know, the, the, the problems that we have in terms of our, uh, the delivery of our mental health services, uh, suicide rates have gone up. Uh, as ripe as a time to have this discussion, right? Yeah. Uh, it's great that you know this. This, I mean, it's not great because of all the problems that you know that we're seeing now um, as a result of the pandemic. But it's it's an opportunity to revisit this for sure, um, mm. and to come up with ways to deal with um, to deal with the situation, uh, and that includes talking about the section uh, and knowing what people actually how people actually respond. Um, and some people may not even think about it, right? Um, it's not. It's not. It's not like it's on everybody's mind, uh, and that's uh, amplifying, <clears throat> amplifying the the discussion is uh, also something that you know would help us know yeah. where people are in terms of um, um, in terms of where they actually stand. Um, yeah. yeah? Uh, so if I much. Just keep it long. Uh, no, you you get you get. Uh, thank you, Doctor Kyle. I just want to try a bit more before I pass it on to the others. Um, okay, so um, we we understand that there's bipartisan support, and this is something that I think uh, even MOH has taken a very clear stance on, and it's something that DG has clearly stated. There's even something that uh, YB Kairi Samuel, now the current Minister of Health, has tweeted about, and he's tweeted about this like way before he even uh, took up office in the Minister of Health. Right, so it is something that there is a lot of bipartisan support on. And um, we have some questions on Slido and it's quite a recurring question on whether is the, how much consideration does religion play into this? And um, state religion, that is. And also, like you mentioned, Dr. Kyra, like traditional values and maybe other obstacles that come into play in trying to repeal section 309. Just wanna open up the floor to, Dr. Ravi, Mananita, or Dr. Sharifa? Yeah, Dr. Ravi, can go ahead. Yeah. yeah, all right. I'm just going to put some perspectives on where people stand. And I think that's really, really important to look into what is the lens of the public. And it's important that our public in this kind of discussions and you know this kind of information is made available to public. Uh, one of the reasons we do need to, uh, or thanks for highlighting where the Ministry of Health stands. The Ministry of Health has been behind this decriminalizing effort really on the forefront from, uh, it, it features in um, uh, the previous, uh, I think it featured from, if you look at the timeline, and I think this is a little bit of a history, so forgive, forgive me. It came as one of the important things that in 2019, the then, uh, Deputy Prime Minister put it up as an agenda of the mental health agenda. And it was, and even when governments have changed, this remained there consistently. This message was in the uh, health minister's uh, address last year. It's in the DG's address this year. And if you do look at it where it stands in uh, an official documents, which is including the World Suicide Prevention Day fact sheet, uh, where this discussion is standing is that the AGC is supposed to prepare a cabinet paper for parliament. So yes, it will go. And then when it, when it reaches parliament, there will be a discussion. It's exceptionally important why people think criminalizing something or putting something against the law is preventative because we have used such laws across to help things to get done. You punish people for murder. You punish people when they litter or when they break public property. But unfortunately, the intent or the, um, I've, for, I've forgotten the forensic term for that, uh, the, the intent of it is that there is an intent to harm others. There's also the intent of uh, achieving a purpose through that. And in fact, unfortunately, when you look into a person who is suicidal, 
this is not as clear as that. People do not go about uh, trying to take their lives in order to have a nefarious intent or harm of others. It is most, mostly many complex reasons which a person believes that at that point and perceives that their situation is cannot be helped or the pain of living, if, if you if I may quote uh, something that I've read. So that kind of person is someone whose resources have been exhausted. So this particular part where I just sort of said should be made available to public, should be made available to people who do not share that lived experience, people who do not know that pain, because a lot of people don't. Well, people think it's a simple matter of you ban, you don't, people don't do it. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen. It, in fact, the only thing that has come up from research evidence across the globe is when you have such laws, uh, when they sit in these kind of com in this context, it prevents people from getting help. It increases stigma. You get very inaccurate suicide rates because people don't actually tell. In fact, in that discussion, and if, if it, I, I'm not aware of the discussion in the Singapore Parliament, but that if that were to come up, and I was, I mean, if we were asked to give an answer, it's quite simple. There's evidence. Uh, there's a paper by Vijay Kumar and Phillips in 2016 that says very clearly, you go and we found that when you criminalize suicide, people don't report suicide. There is a reason for that. In some countries, uh, people who die by suicides, and when because of these attitudes, people don't even want to uh, report it because they don't even get funerals. That's how horrible it is. It is so terrible in a in a moment of in that in that intense grief that the family is going through. They are compounded worse by that. So people just don't report deaths by suicide. So when you remove this, you actually get better data. And with the upcoming NSFIRM, the National Suicide and Fatal Industries Registry, which we hope comes up in another couple of years. We hope to have better rates. And we also found across the world when suicides do get decriminalized, uh, it's important to note that suicide rates actually don't go up. They actually remain static. And because once that big barrier is taken away, people tend to uh, get more, it's easier to do prevention work. It's easier to reach quarters. It, re it reduces stigma. Yes, initially, the first few years, you will get all these undetermined causes of death will be reported as suicide. So you might get a little bit of a, a little jolt, but it's, it's not really the sort of thing that actually causes a, a significant increase in rate. We are not, I think the message the public needs to know is that suicidal person is not a criminal, a suicidal person is in great pain, a suicidal person does not need to be punished, a suicidal person, uh, uh, what do we call it, a suicidal person, when we legal, we decriminalize, we're not legalizing or encouraging suicide, that's a totally mm -hmm. different kind of thing that, these are perceptions that public get. Because poor people, actually, when you ask them, they're not getting, uh, what do we call it, people are not given the choice of information to make a choice. So I think that the information needs to be given. Uh, okay, and if you want to look at where, where these evidences are coming from, they're coming from places where they have done good work. Yes, International Association of Suicide Prevention looked at evidence, looked at places where have, mm, suicides have been decriminalized and seen the collected papers and seen what are their views. The WHO recommends this. So it's sort of like a global recommendation by health and uh, civil society bodies that this needs to be gone. And in fact, they when you look at countries that still keep this law, unfortunately, the Human Development Index, it, it's not a good place to be. If you want to be a country, it's there. these are places where human development indexes are not really good. Human rights issues are there. So mature societies, uh, mature societies, and I think we are getting there. We have to allow our society to make a mature and informed choice. Uh, do get that. And I think our parliamentarians carry what the, who they are representing. And they also mm -hmm. need to get engagement. We probably need to have more conversations with them too, because they need to know this thing. Because unfortunately, all this information sometimes sits, that lived experiences sits very siloed within very academic halls and ivory towers and common people don't get it. And um, one more thing, this is a thing that people think like, oh, why do people still support this? Huh? Why, huh? why do they not? Why are the people so cruel? Remember, suicides are actually a really rare occurrence in communities across the world. So a lot of people do not even come across that discussion until it happens to them. It may go up, but you look at suicide rates in our country, it's 5.8 out of 100,000 population. It's one in, uh, yeah. So you got to see that it's a rare occurrence in communities. So we want to have this kind of big all community change or all society, all, kind, all nation change. You start to have, to have that conversation as well. One more, uh, Sura, yep. maybe I can just uh, interject a bit. Ahead, yeah. the, 
the number of people actually committing suicide, even though we have so-called the data, uh, this is really a tip of the iceberg. You know, people mm -hmm. not only commit suicide before they have, before basically they commit actual suicide, they already might have some intention for, you know, for some time. So these mm -hmm. are maybe, they have already some trials, probably unsuccessful trials, so para-suicide intentions. And, and if you look at the, 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 the iceberg, the whole iceberg, you know, the amount of people actually contemplating is higher, of course, than people actually successfully committing suicide. So basically, we are basically underplaying this issue in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, again, I, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a public health personnel. So I would, I would say that this is basically at the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. We are not actually solving a lot of issues on suicide. We need more work on it, more research on it. And I understand that um, congratulations to the Ministry of Health and our colleagues here for pushing this agenda. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. for it to become a policy agenda, it needs a lot of havoc, it needs a lot of attention, it needs a lot of data. The issue is that, this is what I mentioned just now, the data is so small. It looks as if, you know, this is not a problem, this is not a big problem, when in fact, it is, it is a huge problem. So, of course, we try to uh, deter people who have mental illness from committing suicide. So the suicide is basically the end result or the end final outcome when they are basically, you know, coerced into a, a spot that they cannot think of any way out. So in a way, we as a society, we have failed them. We have failed them. And, and this is why uh, the policy agenda to, to push it into the parliament and things like that, it has to come from basically, you know, the people on the ground. Because the politician might see other things as more important, you know, especially during this COVID, they will see like economy, uh, socially, you know, and, and things like that, which, which we find that this is true, uh, vaccination, you know, and things like that. So these are the more uh, so-called um, priority agenda at this point in time, but we need to show that, you know, this is basically a bigger problem. Mental mm. health illness, so-called... Eh? before they actually go into suicide is a huge problem in Malaysia. Uh, we correctly mentioned that, you know, during this pandemic, there's a lot, lot of other things that's happening as well. And most of these do not get reported or basically do not actually go to seek any healthcare assistance. Uh, they, might, they might feel that they are going to be laughed at, stigmatized, uh, you know, the family members will not uh, encourage that and so on. Some of them just simple um, things like, I don't have transport. These yeah. are, you know, very simple that we think that, you know, um, you can actually go and get help, but you said I, I don't have transport. I rely maybe on my son or my daughter or my husband and things like that. You know, it's simple, simple things that you, you don't think this is happening, but it's happening on the ground. So so I think for us to move this policy agenda to become a reality, um, there needs to be a lot more push. And we need to actually get some, maybe some politicians or some celebrities with us as well. I know that we have. We have a few and we need to push this agenda. If not, it's, it's going to be the same thing. We're going to talk about this if we live long enough, another five years from now or 10 years from now. Thank you. Um, Tura, may, may I just add just two things? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Okay. I just want to add right. like a one quick point before I pass it to you. Sorry, uh, when, when I need No, no so, worries. Uh, uh, yeah, so Dr. Shaffer, you mentioned about like, you know, getting the hair off and getting the discussion. And I think something that um, can be observed in the parliamentary sessions is that it the the suicide stats are usually quoted as your initial sentence. So you've seen you've seen uh, our previous prime minister Dr. Mahathir do this as well, right? It's it's how they gain the walk in parliament. So they mention the suicide statistic. They say this number of people have you know taken their own lives during the pandemic, and then they push the issue onto something else, and then they they try to like you know shift the issue onto something else. So I. I would say that there is that yeah, discussion it, already. It's just that, yeah, what, what do you think the issue is then? Well, um, you you mentioned correctly that because this issue is so intertwined with other other things, other economical, social, you know, uh, there's a lot of other things playing a role in suicide. But the issue is that the suicide is being used as a gender for something else sometimes. Exactly, yeah. and, and basically, you don't actually curtail the issue of suicide. You yeah. talk about finance, which is true. I mean, I mean, we still need to cover that, you know, because suicide um, 
can be caused because of financial stress and you know anxiety and things like that. Um, you don't have a, a work to live. You don't have a, a space to live. You don't have work. So it plays a role, yes. But the suicide itself and also the code, uh, the, 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 you know, the act and the penal code, what do you do with it? So it has to come in from us on the ground on a more clearer agenda so that, you know, if we are able to take this upwards, um, people are more aware of what is the agenda that we want to do. It's not just um, looking at other factors, but we also want to change that law. Is Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaifa. Uh, point and answer. Yep. Um. Sorry. I I don't wish to repeat um anyone's point uh, points at this moment since everyone has shared so much. Uh. But I just wanted to just share this bit. Um. Sura, where you know we were involved in uh, the discussion together with yeah. you know MOH, the various stakeholders, and also AG chambers, right? So from their side, what I'm seeing is um. Even, even if you look at the public as a whole, right? Um, not everyone understands mental health, right? Mental health disorders. So there is a big gap in terms of mental health literacy. So similarly to um, AG Chambers on their side, um, they are also trying to understand mental health because you know, this um, you know, penal code has existed for the longest time. Mm -hmm. So I think um, on their side, they're still trying to understand it. Um, and I also feel that you know, mental health was never a priority until maybe mm -hmm. to 18 to 19. Um, and then now more so because of the whole pandemic where you know, suicide risks have increased. And we've never seen the situation where you know, out in the open in the news, you know, we see um, the news reporting of um, suicide deaths uh, you know, really frequently. Mm -hmm. So I think now that we have this momentum, like someone was saying earlier, this is why this discussion needs to happen now. So that now we have that, that bigger push in that sense. So imagine, Sura, you know, coming from, you know, uh, Miyasa, you know, a, a person like me, you know, we work in the community and we see every single day how people with mental health disorders are being stigmatized and discriminated. So what more people that battle suicidal thoughts, ideation, contemplate suicide, right, or have attempted suicide. So because of, because of this, it is very challenging to bring about this discussion out in the open we know it's a taboo not only in the malay culture it is for the chinese it is for the indian mm -hmm. it's for everyone really so in order for us to really um you know like we were saying having this this huge havoc or, or voice everyone needs to be talking about it so it has it has to be multi-sectoral you know um all the different stakeholders the civil society everyone needs to be engaged in this discussion and then only we see you know the, the the huge push for it so the priority is not given uh, people don't understand it um, but now with the pandemic hopefully um, this is where it, it will happen that's the hope thank you, thank you so much Manilita and um, just a final question before we um, we can have our short break so we've kind of covered all of the different stakeholders that are involved in this but how does decriminalizing suicide actually look like? So how does this repealing process look like? Because on Puanita, you mentioned the AG chambers. So now there's the public, and then the, we have our policymakers, and then there's AG chambers. But how does this process look like? And I think Dr. Kyril, you mentioned like the need for voting in parliament. So could, um, could anyone just like sort of walk us through that step-by-step -step process of how does one even repeal Section 309 if it were to happen? Mm, Dr. Yeah, uh, or... I, I don't think that we have any lawyers uh, with us. Do we have it? Uh, anyone, Surat? I mean, do we have any lawyers here with us? No. I well, don't I, think I, so. Yeah, I yeah. So. I, I, I'm not a lawyer myself, but I think the important thing is to, um, one, we mentioned about the policy agenda and pushing, there must be a proposal saying that we want to change this law into something else because we cannot. We cannot just say that we don't want this law. It has to be some changes or some improvement. But with that, that, mean, that means there's a lot of things that has to come about, data and the reasons for that. And then it has to table in the parliament and get the votes. If there is no votes in the parliament, th that means basically there's no, no supporters. It will, not be tabled, it will not be tabled as improvement in the act. 
So this has happens with example the tobacco the, the uh, uh, tobacco act. Uh, we have our tobacco act, the existing tobacco act, but there's also some changes that has been purported from the Ministry of Health on on smoking like vape and things like that. So before it actually goes on the ground and implemented as an enforcement, it has to be tabled out in the parliament and approved on, on, on that level. So we don't have that yet. We have to push uh, or basically we have to propose the agenda for this act so-called uh, to be some improvement according to the experts. And the experts would be you know, our, 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 our friends from the psychiatrists, from NGOs and things like that. And what we propose would be changes into this act. So to decrypt, uh, you know, uh, we must suggest that we should not criminalize our suicide um, people or basically uh, participants who try to commit suicide because this would actually deter them from getting reported and things like that. And we have to propose another agenda. So this is not something which is easy. It, it can take years, but um, it has to start somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm also not a lawyer, and uh, but I mentioned earlier that I, I believe that it, it, in terms of process, if you're talking about voting in parliament, it requires a simple majority for, for it to, to go through. Lah. But there's a whole logistics of it, right? Like uh, how, what Prof, uh, Prof uh, Sharifa was saying. Um, it's in, say, uh, um, um, regulating tobacco, you know, uh, there, there's an added sort of, there's an, there there's an added sort of uh, factor where, you know, you have lobbies or you have the industry playing a role, pushing for their agenda. Uh, there's, there's no such thing as an industry <laughs> involvement here, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, it is very important that as we've agreed here, uh, that um, the policy agenda is, is it, it's set, but it's also amplified. And if there are people who who have sort of, um, you know, like what I suggested earlier, people have differing views, then uh, there's got to there's got to be attempts to try to shift these views, uh, so that this sort of process gets fed into the representatives who be confident enough to go in and um, and 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 go along with with the agenda, right? Um, so um, I agree with Prof Sharifa. I think I think you. Will know will know more than Asla, but um, um, but from that policy agenda sort of um, um, uh, process, then uh, I think we're all in agreement here to make sure that you know it's this it, it gets uh, there's havoc, uh, it gets amplified. Uh, if people hold um, or if people contest um, or, or challenge uh, the agenda, then uh, you know we think of ways to actually. Um, Tell them that look, you know, um, consider this, consider that. You know, why are you still holding on to, to to such a view? No one's challenging your no one's challenging your beliefs. For example, Surah, just to go back to your question, but really, no one's challenging anyone's beliefs here. Um, in fact, uh, you know, it's it's something that we can, you know, it's 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 something that you can actually envision a consensus of, right? Um, nobody would encourage suicide anyway. No yeah. one. You could be. You can be. You can be a a a a. a um, but there is, you know, the the common ground here is that we want to stop. We want to see suicides, uh, suicide rates go down. We want to make sure that people get help. We want to make sure that, um, we want to make sure that um, uh, we want to make sure that uh, um. Um, there is um, uh, uh, the, 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 the relevant structures to support um, people, um, you know, from sliding into um, the situation where they have ideation of suicide and stuff like that. So there's, it's, it's there, there, there we have this sort of agreement, uh, no matter where on the value spectrum you sit, you know, uh, it could be the most deeply pious person, you could be the most secular person, but we agree that this is something that we need to look into. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think that would be the thing, as we've agreed here, that would carry um, the agenda at the lawmaking sort of level. Um, uh, I don't think I'm adding much, anything new here, la, but 
but in terms of the legal process, um, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's, yeah, I mean, in terms of voting in parliament, that's what's happened, what should happen. But um, mm. mentioning this a lot, um, if you take a look at the Singapore example, um, what happened with this was uh, that it was, uh, it wasn't just this, it wasn't just section 309, it was, it was a context where a series of uh, things were actually changed. So it, it was like, it was legal reform um, where they addressed a number of issues. So mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe there is also, um, there, 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 there might also be a reason to actually consider whether or not um, legal reform can be packaged. Yeah. Uh, so you have this alongside a few other things. Uh, and maybe that would appeal more to the public. I don't know. I mean, just just to just to uh, just just think. All right. Uh, a few other things were actually passed alongside this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kari. Um, the next slide. So, um, what we have here is the chart from. Uh, on the right, you see is a chart from 2018 on the distribution of psychiatrists in Malaysia. And the numbers that you see are the ratio of the number of psychiatrists per 100,000 population. This is something that uh, I think Dr. Sharifa touched on earlier as well. So this is distribution across each state. And uh, notably, this data set is from 2018, so the numbers um, would probably have grown. And on the left you have is the table of the mental health funding based on um, the allocation of the, uh, the total budget allocation for the Ministry of Health. So you can notice the trend there and how the percentage of the total healthcare budget allocated to mental healthcare has kind of decreased to 0.98% in 2021. So I'd like to put this as the backdrop of our next discussion. So um, the panel could provide us some insights on how the Malaysian mental health support sector is right now in terms of accessibility, and how it compares to other countries around the world. Um, could I invite Dr. Sharifa to start this? Is that okay? Yeah, thank you, Sura. Um, this is as clear as crystal how the priority is being set by certain members of the, you know, um, so-called um, the government, but also the stakeholders, and, and probably they have not heard enough grouses from the ground and um, how much more should we prove to, to them that um, it all starts with um, how the government sets the priority but also and it falls down to budget and human resource. So if you don't have enough ratios for certain areas um, and, and of course psychiatrists are by themselves a very um, highly skilled speciality but um, reflecting that, you can even look at ratio of doctors to certain states. And going more, you look at certain speciality, and, and this shows that it, you know um, it is very much concentrated in certain areas. Uh, example in uh, Klang Valley, you know the big big cities and all. And you see that, and I, I assume that this are uh, mixture of public and also private uh, sura. If you actually divide this into public and private, you can see that this is even worse. That means if you have that, maybe you can, um, let's say I, I give an example, let's say split it into 50 per percent, eh? you get even worse data or ratios. So, so how are you going to manage that? So it boils down to human resource and budget. And how does people see or how does the fraternity, the whole medical health fraternity view mental health as a priority? Uh, I, I'm not saying that this is not seen as a, 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 a priority. Uh, I, I don't want to undermine um, maybe a certain, certain, uh, certain perspective of other people, but uh, from the decreasing trend and percentage of um, healthcare budget allocated, this shows that, you know, um, as if we are not putting enough emphasis on mental health um, issues or mental health um, areas or the rest that has that the Malaysia is facing at this point in time. If you look at other countries, 
and I'm talking in perspective of ratios. Eh? Um, mm. You look at other countries, of course, they might come from developed countries like OECD countries and things like that, where you have enough resources, you have enough manpower, you have enough beds, you know, and things like that, rural versus uh, the urban areas and so on. Malaysia is definitely falling behind in that sense. And of course, when you look at a uh, certain specialty like uh, psychiatry and even psychologists, clinical psychologists, we see that this is very deficient in Malaysia. So why are we not uh, giving this priority to our colleagues in, in that sense? Eh? Um, and if you are not uh, giving this priority, are there other manpowers, example, maybe nurses or trained mm -hmm. medical assistant MAs, eh? uh, trained uh, medical assistants or trained nurses or trained healthcare providers, other healthcare providers that can help when you don't, because um, psychiatrists are very highly skilled, eh? highly trained. They are doctors in the first place. They have to go for specialty masters or they come up, they come from abroad and things like that. Some of them may want to go into teaching, so they will go for PhD and so on. But if you don't have enough psychiatrists, you can actually supplement by having other types of so-called uh, support system. So these can be mm -hmm. nursing who are trained nurses or MAs or you know some um, some sort of other fraternities that we help to support our our psychiatrists as well. So this can be the public care, public health care, and mm -hmm. our primary care. So do we have that as well? We we don't. We don't. I, I'm giving you the answer. We don't. So um, we we need to highlight this. I I I'm sure the government knows this because this come from them. Yeah. <laughs> but we we need to highlight this is not enough. For for this um, agenda for for the country, um, you you cannot have you know a decreasing budget and at the same time you're saying that oh I, I want you to improve your healthcare services how how can you do that it's a trade off right you you mm -hmm. you decrease your the budget but at the same time we say that oh I want you to emphasize on on mental health we, we it's a trade off you you cannot do that you have to support them so I I think in the first place um. The budget is definitely not enough and I think that they need to strengthen not only on the um, psychiatrist uh, inpatient but also how detection in the first place and from the primary care and also from the public health so that detection can actually warrants uh, can actually prevents from admission so mm -hmm. so if you look at this slide um, this bit very well so-called um, for me this defeats the purpose it, it's, it's so small is decreasing in, in trend and also you can see that the ratio is not enough yeah. very highly concentrated on urbanized area and if you divide this into public and private and not many people can access the private system eh, Sura? Yeah. we don't have a social insurance in malaysia most of these are private health insurance and most of the private insurance does not cover on certain mental health issues all right okay so so basically that sums uh, my 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 take on this yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sharif. Um, Anita? Yeah, maybe I just want to echo what um, Dr. Sharif just said. Um, okay, one thing, obviously, um, psychiatrists will never be enough. <laughs> um, so because of that known fact, um, I think what Dr. Sharif said was important, um, which I mentioned earlier, which is the task shifting part. So if we're able to implement that, then, um, you know, we will be able to help more people because we know um, mental health services is very much focused in Klang Valley, Selangor. Um, not only mental health services, but NGOs as well. We very much concentrate on these areas. And so uh, the more rural you go into, the further you go from central, um, the least services um, are available for people. So um, barrier to access um, is still there, um, obviously. Um, but also the other thing that we need to also realize is continuum of care, uh, which means that not everyone that has a mental health struggle needs uh, intensive clinical intervention. Uh, and that is why that task shifting is important again, right? So you're able to empower the community, um, you know, people can um, become a resource in that sense. And one of the interesting things, um, you know, via the health systems research uh, that was done in 2016, I believe with uh, Harvard University and MOH, clearly what uh, Dr. Sharifa said, 49% um, of Malaysians, when they go through a mental health struggle, their first point of contact is actually their GP. 
So if we can leverage on primary care, I think that would be fantastic, right? Um, because we've got what um, health clinics, Libu and a thousand plus. We've got GP six seven thousand. So imagine if we are able to do that, right? So uh, focusing on more uh, training, support, supervision, all these kind of things, and uh, of course uh, mental health screening. Um, to be honest, uh, you know, on the ground, a lot of peers tell us all the time, Panita, um, we do go to health clinics, we do go and see a GP, but uh, we come back empty-handed because. Mm. You see, a person that struggles, can Sura, um, Dr. Sharifah, and everyone can uh, appear with a mental health, um, you know, struggle, ke issues. Mm. Ke they don't go in and say, Doctor, I have a mental health issue. You don't say that. You come in with physical manifestation, at the point you say things like, I don't feel so good. So imagine if the person attending to you, an MO, ke, for example, is not trained at the point well versed in mental health, that person is going to go back empty handed. So, mm. ini banyak yang kita nampak. Uh, we, we see this a lot. The other thing, uh, one conversation that happens frequently uh, is also GPs. Um, there's also stigma. Um, um, I feel that if, you know, they are incentivized, if we um, can talk about it, uh, you know, uh, more openly in that sense, um, because I had a conversation um, last week, actually, with Dr. Javed, who is the uh, president of the World Psychiatric Association, uh, and he was telling us that, you know, there's a lot of stigma amongst GPs as well. So stigma, again, Dr. Sharifah, and everyone continues to be that barrier as well, um, you know, across the board, last sebenarnya, okay? So that's one. The other thing that I um, mm, um, like to talk sorry. about... Um, Sorry, can you, can you expand on the stigma amongst GPs? Like, what is the stigma amongst GPs? Um, yeah, amongst, okay. See, a lot of um, our peers can, when they go and see a GP, um, GPs have this stigma where, you know, um, when you don't understand mental health disorders, can they will just say, you know, you are faking it because you just want an MC. Maknanya, you malas nak pergi kerja ke, for example, um, mental health isn't real, you know, just snap out of it. Um, a lot of, you see, I, we don't have the data, you see, so then it becomes anecdotal. Tetapi, we see this a lot happening on the ground. And when we have this conversation with other people, like I mentioned, even Dr. Javed himself, um, and Dr. Mo, um, uh, associate professor and also um, clinical psychiatrist also mentioned um, where, you know, stigma is also prevalent, but there is data to show um, that, stigma amongst mental health professional is higher than the public put together. Um, so, so we know this is true in that sense, right? So more needs to be done. Uh, maybe it is because of the training, maybe it is what is in the textbook, I am not sure. Uh, but this is what um, has been said and is in that data and research. Um, the other thing that I want to mention as well is we really, like Dr. Sharka was saying, we need investment and prioritization in mental health. And this is where we really need to expand community mental health services because recovery is in the community. We all know this. But we do not have enough funds. And that is why, you know, every single year when the money comes out, you know, this one plus percent, you know, 66 percent is given to the four big mental health, mental institutions or the big um, psychiatric hospitals, which only serves about what one plus percent of people with mental health disorders. Right. So what happens to the 99 percent of others that have, you know, other uh, mental health conditions They are in the community? So they are under um, served in that sense, right? So they're not being treated. So I think the prioritization is important, the investment in the in mental health. And imagine last year, you know, WHO had to do a theme, you know, saying, you know, mental health for, for all greater investment, greater access, you know, mm -hmm. just to ensure and, and you know, encouraging people to look, you need to invest. We must invest in mental health. And true enough, we see that now when, you know, this whole pandemic happened, we're not ready for it because we do not have comprehensive mental health services. So hopefully through this discussion, you know, uh, more can be done, um, especially now. Yeah, one of the setback for GPs is one of them is how they want to charge Sura for let's say a, a common cold yeah. or something that you can prescribe antibiotics. You can charge let's say let's say a simple case maybe let's say fifty to seventy ringgit maybe let's say a simple case for maybe half an hour consultation. But for a GP, for you to actually give so called uh, mental health advice or psychological treatment there's no standardized you know um how much do you charge because it's not a procedure it's not something like you do ect and you say okay this ect i will charge let's say 100 
But if you're going to counsel someone, let's say he's having some depression or a bit of um, stress, how would you charge? There's not much charges for just speaking, you know? So mm -hmm. this is one of the issues, how, how primary care or even the GPs would see this as probably less priority because the way that they are reimbursed is, is not good. Same thing with insurance. Some of the mental health issues are not being covered. Mm -hmm. So they cannot charge, you know? So that deters them from being actively involved in, in some cases. So this is where, you know, you need a uh, policy, you need some laws, you need prioritization, you need some structure to say that, you know, um, there's, there's more to it, you can actually charge a certain amount and things like that. Uh, Dr. Sharifah, I just wanted to add, um, you know, when I was going through my struggles eight years ago, uh, one of my support system was actually my two GPs uh, who helped me so much because, you know, they're, they're within the community. They're like five minutes away from my home. Uh, correct, that is correct. how, how yeah. big how big and important of a role GPs correct. can actually yeah. play, Dr. Sharifa. Yeah. Sure, mm. sure. I, I totally agree with you because they are the primary care. We have Betul. thousands of them. Yes. Mm. We have thousands of them, but Betul. we are not, when I say we means um, in, in some way, the government is not utilizing them enough. Yes. Betul. But Betul. The, the, yeah, the financing system of how UK does it and Malaysia does it is a bit different. Um, UK would go into capitation. There's there's other things involved, payment from the states. Uh, Malaysia mm. do not have that. It's basically fee for service. So you charge your patient, and uh, thank God for certain GPs for for some reason or the other they have priority in this, which is which is what we want. Like what Miss mm. um, Anita mentioned correctly, eh? this is what we want because because some GP you tell them that oh I have this and that they say that oh, uh, I I'm not dealing with you. Uh, you you don't come here anymore. I'm not trained in this. I, you may, you know, and, and mm. things like that. So basically, this deter people from coming again and again. Betul. And some GPs see it as a priority, Sura, um, uh, Dr. Sharifah, that one of our new clinics that opened up here, they have a visiting psychiatrist that comes here. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. Very, very happy to mm. see that progress happening and uh, for GPs to see that being a priority for their clients. Mm. Thank you so much, um, Pananita and Dr. Sharifa. Uh, actually, community-based care is something that like we also want to like um go deeper into uh, to it later in the session because that's one of the suicide prevention policies that we are kind of looking at as well and how we can expand on that. Um, but before we move towards that, I'd like to bring in uh, Dr. Ravi on this because um, it is like we can see the stats and it is common public perception that accessibility across states to mental health services isn't as it should be. But uh, Dr. Ravi works in a hospital in Miri, so I'd like to get some of these lived experiences of working in um, the mental health department. Yep, yep. I do have to, let's start by talking about um, how um, national health care services are funded. Uh, we do need to know when it's, um, when you, you really do need, uh, I think this has been acknowledged by publicly by ministers and uh, people who, uh, talk about how healthcare systems are very stretched thin, and even more, they became they. You got a litmus test in the form of the pandemic, and you really see that very difficult. It, it's become very difficult. It really, really does become very difficult for people to look into that. So that is a system that is been mentioned to be not being funded. So everybody starts thinking, what does funding actually do? Funding puts in not just paying psychiatrists or you know one or few people. It talks about the whole system. And when you look at mental health systems, okay, we, we're moving from healthcare to mental health. You do look, at, let's look at the WHO pyramid where the, 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 the top of the pyramid, which has the so-called, uh, they're very expensive, but you don't need that many of them are people who are highly specialized. People who are unfortunately people like me, who you don't need that many of us. You really don't need them because we do, our, the, the people that we serve or the people we serve have really, really complex difficulties. Uh, very, very difficult and they need very specialized services. And then you go on to the exceptional importance of community-based care, community-based specialized care, and then you go to primary care. And these form the top half of the pyramid, which calls formal services. And then you have the bottom half of the pyramid where there are informal services, which also go on to self-care and, commu and home and community-based uh, community support. 
So you want to invest, you've got to invest appropriately, where you've got to invest more where the bottom of the pyramid where there are more people, but it's not so expensive to invest on them versus you want to invest on the top people where it's also more expensive, but you need less of them. Uh, even that we are seeing across pyramid, the whole pyramid, there's a need for more investment. So you do need to look into investing that. And you do need to also look into investing in, uh, we don't work in silos, especially psychiatrists. We don't just work, we work with the patient. There's a lot of other people involved in a team. And when you talk about a team, you talk about a team where you work with people who do occupational therapy, people who do psychological work, social workers. You talk about people who work um clinical psychologists, you talk about community uh, trained lay counselors, uh, volunteers, you talk about uh, you talk about that as a network, you talk about social workers under social care. So you need to look at whether you can build a system that sort of is working and communicating with each other. And it's exceptionally important that you talk about GPs, yes, you are talking about private GPs, you also talk about primary care in terms of health clinics, and you do need to see where, where uh, how they all flow in. So let's talk about my place. So our place is very interesting. We are the only resident service with psychiatry services. And that's sort of a situation you get in places where are we are not. Uh, so you don't get that much of an option if you want to look at it. It's either, either us or either us, if you're looking at specialized services, it's just us, unfortunately. Like you're looking at the highest tier of the care. You don't even have private, a resident private psychiatrist as well. So this looks, this, this presents to us the real need for us to start working with our primary care, social care, and so on and so forth. So how do we fit into this pyramid? Yes, we do exist for inpatient care, outpatient care, community care, all of that, that's us. Like, let's not waste too much time on us. How do you integrate the primary care teams? So we have what we call as good communication and referral pathways from our primary care government clinics and our primary care private clinics, which I think I engage with the, we engage with the primary care clinics in the private sector this time. So we actually started talking to them and how to refer to us, which, who do you call and send them immediately? Who do you just write a letter? And you know that we exist and the number, it's important for our GPs to know uh, what they can, uh, what, uh, who they need to refer and who they can manage on their own. We have GPs who handle clients with common mental health problems on their own, and you need to provide that and, 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 where do we look at to that is you need to provide training for them as well. And uh, it's good now that family medicine specialists do get uh, in the, I mean, in the good few years, I mean, I mean, I've not been working too long, but uh, I've always seen family medicine people, family medicine uh, specialists who are when they're part of the training, they do come get a, a, attached to us. They learn about services and they also go on to run services. Our primary care clinics here, run a mental health, the big ones in Miri City, there's two, uh, they run mental health clinics every week and they, and they do differ and this thing. So it's important to not just uh, keep the referral pathways open. It's also important that we also return patients back to the community. And that's something that we also need to, that's a, that's a learning for us, mm -hmm. which we return back patients to be created in the community because people are best, people recover best closest to their home, not somewhere mm -hmm. far. So that's important. We work very closely with social care. Social care, it's very important to help the people who are exceptionally disadvantaged. So we work with our JKM or counselors in JKM. They do refer people. Uh, they, people go there and to get referrals and people do, they do run support hotlines as well. So how is access to care? I would say um, we, uh, we do actively make ourselves known that we exist so that care comes to us. We keep red tape to the bare minimum or the, the bare allowed as well, people can refer and uh, people are allowed to give referrals. We also have open channels from schools to refer to us, institutions to refer to us. We work with counselors across, and we work with counselors across uh, various uh, sectors as well to get people to come to us and go on. But again, that comes a lot with the, oh, sorry, I'm hearing a lot of background noise. Uh, okay, uh, it, all of this, which I talk and looks a bit like an ideal system, I didn't come across one day. It took, it took a lot of engagement work from our side, from their side, from all the stakeholders to work as one collective team. And why do we, and, and probably the reason we work with that is because we are the only place, like it or not, somewhere down the line, we have to look in, in, in a more logistical sense, we are the people who are going to receive, receive people. It's good to prevent in the primary level. It's important that uh, not, I, 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 we go around telling people, it's not that everyone needs a psychiatrist to solve 
uh, to, to help solve their distress and all. A lot of these things can happen in the community. So I do echo what we say there. So access to care is certainly improving our um, clinic statistics is going up, which is good. Uh, what is also good is that we do need to sit and listen what people need and provide the services that we need. We may not be, uh, so that's, that's something that goes about. So you do look into the fact that it's not just the number, it's not just the availability, it's more of uh, people's difficulties and needs in, in a population where you really need to have good pathways where people don't get shunted across systems but people are sent to, uh, people get the help they need fast and accurately. And uh, people are, all, and more importantly, it's not just about all talk, all medicine and all of that. You really need to look into re recovery as well. Uh, new things that are coming up is that we do, pref uh, I mean, I think this one is provide, it's something that um, some NGOs as well as uh, formal services also provide as part of employment, things that we should also look into is about the accommodation, support the education. These are things that are coming up within Ministry of Health. So far, supported employment is getting a lot of traction and establishment. Um, we things that we do need to establish a bit better, which is still very much in pilots and trials are supported accommodation, which needs a lot of collaborators. Why supported accommodation? Why do people need to be supported where they stay? Uh, you do realize a lot of mental, people with chronic mental health problems are left homeless. And homelessness is a serious problem that contributes to mental health problems. You see that people get mental health problems. Uh, mental health problems start before 14 and the education is affected. If your education is affected, your employability and your opportunities in life get affected. So these are areas that we do need to look into. So if you talk about investment and access to care, look at it very, uh, we do hope people who invest, invest holistically, invest mm -hmm. in places, invest in connecting a fragmented, uh, we should not have silos. You have to invest in a way that it all connects together. And it takes a lot of effort in the, locally. And of course, we're very good to also, and the systems are all in place. Everything is in, the systems can be made in place, but you do need that investment for it to work together. Because besides all of this, GPs are also doing other work. Everyone else is doing 3000 different things at the same time. So that's why when you fund, you need to make sure that people there are enough people to do enough time to do the work we do. And it's unfortunate, and I'm going to say this very unfortunately, uh, we don't translate well to statistics because you need to spend a lot of time with a person which doesn't translate as surgery time, doesn't translate as medicine time, doesn't translate as things like that. Very hard to, how do I say? If you look at it in a paper sense, huh, it's like, even if a, if a, a, a sub-specialized surgeon does one or two surgeries, it looks good on paper. But you look at this like, you, we really need to have different sort, I mean, look better outcome measures. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we are getting them, actually, we are getting them. We're getting a not just number of attendances, we are looking at outcome measures that are better. And also outcome measures, these are mental health outcome measures, people who are employed, people who go on to finish school and all of that. But yeah. Uh, more investment is needed, but you, if you ever want to look into connecting dots, is that you really need to start working all the systems to work together. That's just mm -hmm. a little bit of my thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. Um, yeah, I, I think that paints it, the, the whole, kind of the whole picture of what is going on right now in the mental health support team. Because we spoke about funding, we spoke about accessibility, and Dr. Ravi spoke about where the funding should go to as well. So thank you so much for your different perspectives. And that kind of um, wraps up the first part of our discussion on like what is going on right now, what the status quo is, and now we want to shift our focus to the moving forward bit. So, what should change, and how can we make these changes? So, um, could I get the next slide, please? Yep. So, um, what we're going to look at now is the case studies of how suicide has been decriminalized. So the two things that we want to tackle in this next part is um, decriminalization of suicide, how we're going to do it, and then also suicide prevention policies. So beyond that, kind of touching back on the things that we just recently mentioned about uh, the mental health care and community care. But firstly, now, um, this what, what you see on your screen here is how Singapore decriminalized suicide. So Singapore officially repealed Section 309 in May 2019 with um, the government working closely with NGOs like Samaritans of Singapore to roll out their suicide prevention strategy. So notably, they also empowered the police to intervene in situations where the suicidal person may be a danger to himself or others. Um, now on the next slide, 
What you see here is that India took a slightly different approach. So India in July 2018, um, what they did was, despite Section 309 still being in effect, the government introduced the Mental Health Act 2017 that restricts its implementation. So Article 115 of this Act that um, states that any person who attempts to commit suicide shall be presumed unless proof otherwise to have severe stress and should not be tried under the code. So the next point then states that the government shall take on the duty to provide care. So what this does, it, it provides a way to circumvent that Section 309. So based on these two different case studies, I think this is where uh, Dr. Ariel, I'd like to bring you back in into the conversation. What, what do you think is the best approach for Malaysia, considering that there are these two different approaches that can be taken, either completely repealing Section 309 or something that may be a bit more politically feasible of introducing a new act. So um, could you comment on this? Um, well, uh, uh, our position has been to call for it, for the repeal of uh, Section 309. But uh, at the same time, um, there is also this uh, Sort of another way of thinking about how you can deal with um, the criminalization of attempted suicide, um, but I it, it would this would be um, partial decrim rather than a full decriminalization. Uh, although I I I suppose the wording of the um, of the act itself is. Um, strong enough to uh, you know the presumption of mental health there is strong enough to basically circumvent as uh, Sura, as you mentioned um, um, the possibility of um, uh, there being um, punishment i'm saying this because uh, if you take a look at the discourse in india there is still uh, uh, even now there is still um, um, this uh, call for full de full decriminalization mm -hmm. um, and the argument has been that um, um, what Mental Health Act and uh, it, it's nothing doing, you need to go for a repeal of the act. Um, I am not sure if um, there has been a discussion about um, uh, the possibility of um, doing something that India has done, although I guess the legal infrastructures may be there with um, um, our own Mental Health Act, for example. Um, but um, I guess the question is which of this option, if we were to talk about options here, right, uh, would yeah. be better given our socio uh, cultural context. Would, yeah. for example, right, uh, I, I pose a question here, would, for example, the Indian solution appease a more wide ranging sort of stakeholders. Exactly. Right? Yeah. If there are, if there are, um, if, if there's this feeling of being unsure, right, about um, um, something that is a bit more compromised, if I can put it that way, uh, mm -hmm. appeal um, to um, people who are maybe hesitant uh, to go for full uh, decriminalization. Um, but having said that, um, I guess from an advocacy point of view, um, a repeal would mean decriminalization, right? Um, yeah. Uh, this, the, the, the India example would be something um, uh, a little bit, um, a little bit less uh, than that. Um, but yeah, it's 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 an interesting way to deal with the uh, situation, especially given the fact that the act itself, um, uh, not only um, okay, because we're talking about section three hundred nine here, but the act itself um, also um, um, has sort of um, um, offer. Uh, uh, mental health care uh, to 
um, to to its citizens, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 in my previous life, I was an academic, and uh, sometimes academic has this very sort of um, um, <laughs> uh, uh, they don't they don't necessarily give you yes or no or this or that answer, but A middle uh, ground take. Uh, on. <laughs> it, it would be it would be something that's interesting to think about. Um, yeah. uh, if we if we can um, if we can. Um, uh, if we can uh, initiate a discussion about yeah. uh, options as to how this can be done. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Nandikara. So I, I think the thing that you mentioned that was quite pertinent to this is the um, what would be more culturally suitable or what can be done quicker, right? And what would be more culturally feasible? Um, but something that I, and you also touched on uh, that India is also calling for full decriminalization and something that I think um, MSGA, like when we were doing our research in this, that we picked up on was that there were a lot of complaints that the on the force um, police or even whoever were bringing the people in, right, when they reported the police, the police weren't necessarily aware of this newer act. And they know the Section 309. And because of that, the police that were on the ground, so they generally like the constable, they tend to just do what they usually do which is the section 309 procedure, take them in and then keep them within um, the prison for about 24 hours. And what usually happens is there are multiple cases of um, uh, victims, unfortunately, committing suicide in jail itself before they could receive care. And I just wanted to bring in um, Juan Nanita, if I may, on this to see if, um, if Malaysia were to take an approach like this, where we try to circumvent section 309, or even right now with uh, the current mental health act that we have, do you, is, do you hear stories or have you actually like experienced any of these things with uh, your peers where because they don't receive care quickly enough, then you get further issues of, you know, them um, unfortunately committing suicide or just self-harm as well? Yep, definitely. Um, I think that if, um, you know, when you don't get the help fast enough or early enough, um, obviously your uh, prognosis isn't good, right? So recovery becomes um, longer, uh, possibly uh, it, it becomes harder as well. Um, and I think what is more important, Sura, for all of us to understand that when you go, um, you know, the 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 approach uh, towards recovery must be holistic. So it must be a biopsychosocial spiritual approach. Um, which is very important. It doesn't mean that, you know, let's say you have a severe mental health condition, you know, you just say, you know, take that medication or go for that therapy. Uh, you know, you, you need the support, you know, you need to have, you know, good sleep, enough sleep, you've got to eat well, you know, you've got to exercise, you've got to take care of yourself, you've got to, um, you know, have social connectedness, um, you know, um, make yourself useful, engage in social activities, have that support system. So there, there it's a lot of things, um, you know, for you to be able to go through that recovery process effectively. It's not just going to be one thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having said that, so just imagine not doing all of that and then yeah. getting the help late. So obviously, you know, you're, it's going to be difficult to go through. And that is why so many people call befrienders, right? Because you are already battling you know, that, that you are already in a severe stage. And this is also why uh, more men, um, you know, die via suicide, right? Because, you know, you get the help late. That's also one thing because at Miyasa, I can tell you, 70% of people that reach out to us are females. 30% are men. And the 30% of men that come out and, and talk to us and get the help, they are already at the extreme end. They are already battling chronic emptiness. They are already battling, uh, you know, intense uh, suicidal ideation. You know, so this is the group of people that that come um, forward. So men men's mental health is also um, highly stigmatized uh, because of how, you know, the whole culture, how men are brought up, you know, men up. You know, boys don't cry. Um, and I think that now um, with this whole pandemic, you know, that is the silver lining, um, you know, Sura, because we're able to normalize this discussion. People feel more encouraged to reach out for the help. So we see, um, you know, help seeking behavior has increased 
-hmm. mental health literacy definitely has improved. Um, there's more empathy and compassion today because uh, more people are struggling. Even the normal people now get a glimpse of what a mental health struggle is. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, a lot of um, positive things have happened throughout, um, you know, this pandemic hit as well. So yes, definitely a holistic approach and please get, um, you know, the treatment early. But of course, prevention, definitely uh, much better than cure. <laughs> mm. Thank you so much, Dr. Annie. Um, what we'll be moving on to right now is, so we've kind of, I think it's pretty clear that um, across the panel and also just um, across like society, including like the lawmakers itself, that decriminalizing um, suicide fully is definitely a better approach than um, you know trying to circumvent it because as Juan Anita mentioned, like it might delay the um, time that it takes for people to receive the care that they need. So um, moving forward, what we'd like to look at is now things that we've kind of already touched on throughout the whole session, but on suicide prevention policies. So once we decriminalize suicide, what happens next? Because we know that it's not the all out solution and it's something that has been repeated continuously throughout. So um, what we've done is, uh, could I get the next slide please? So um, what we have actually done in MSGA is that we've done uh, some research on some best practices across the world. And we've brought together a couple of ideas into our um, policy recommendation document. And um, what this is, is these are some ideas from different countries and what they have done and how we can try to incorporate them into the Malaysian system. So the first one that we want to pick up on is um, this idea of a mass surveillance and care. So this is something that Thailand has done. And I, I think Dr. Sharifa also mentioned earlier about you know, doing these screenings. And what Thailand did is Thailand conducted mass screenings of the population to determine vulnerable individuals. And by 2016, more than 14 million people had been screened for depression and received mental health education. To increase the accessibility of standard care for people with depressive disorders from 5.1% in 2009 to 48.5% in 2016. So that's from 5% accessibility to 48% accessibility. So um, the question for the panel today is, would an approach as such work in Malaysia? So this is a mass screening of the population and then using that data into a surveillance and care system. So I know it sounds radical, but it is something that raise the accessibility to depression care from 5% to 48% in Thailand. So is something like this possible in Malaysia? Um, if I can just say, you want a screen, make sure I'm you have the... Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you for a bit. Yeah, yeah just sorry. If you would like to screen, you must make sure there is that catchment at the end to catch those you have screened. It is really not fair if we screen people and leave them hanging. That is not, I uh, mean, in the sense that waiting in lurch, like, hey, what happened to my results? What does mm. this mean? What does that, um, that this is? So um, I like to talk about how a model, a local model, they use this. As I say, our social care does do the screening. So what they do is that they make it very clear up front that if you take a screening, it will take a while for someone to come and respond to you. So that is important to make a clear definition that this screening is not equivalent to crisis care. Let's start with that. It's really important that the messages get very clear so that people do not get let down by screening services. Screening mm -hmm. is very different from crisis care. Uh, crisis hotlines are different from screening as well. So it's important that, and then they do get people screening and you need to know that screening tools are not very foolproof. That second part of that, we have an exceptional heterogeneous population. People speak different languages. People use different, people use different kinds of social media. People communicate distress very differently. So you want to wonder whether if you want to do mass, um, if you want to talk about mass screening, do you have a good tool? We might not have that good tool yet. And remember the same tool, if you if you individual X is screamed in the same tool with a different different language, you might actually get different different responses of distress. And you do not want your cutoffs to be in who gets what screening. So that's important of that too. So my concern of screening is that you have a highly heterogeneous population. You have a very, um, if you want to look at adopting models, you would want to look into adopting models that have worked in countries where the populations are 
as heterogeneous as ours. Lah. So that's one. And it's important that you must make sure when you screen, you are responding to them. So what our local social care does, does is that they tell in advance, if you will, you can take a screening and someone will get back to you within a week. So they actually call back within a week. And then uh, they also talk to them first and then decide whether they need further care and then they channel them. So I've been actually the part where I receive the patients. So I get them like after there is that process, like two to three, two to three weeks. So people need to be getting that thought that, uh, that that's the sort of message you need to sell to people that so that people don't get let down by services. And when you get let down by services, and that's really important, and with evidence that evidence that's gone on, if you get let down once, you don't ever go back there again. So mm -hmm. it's important, whatever intervention we do, we need to tell the truth, we need to sell the truth, and we need to be accountable for whatever we do. It's very, very unfair to screen and leave people at that point there. It can leave people in worse states than they were even attending screening. They could have actually, instead, instead of taking that screening, they could have gone to a health clinic and spoken to a psychologist. They, we have psychologists in health clinics as well. Or they could have just spoken to a lay volunteer or could have just spoken to someone else rather than being felt that, you know, when you're not responded to, you're exceptionally invalidated. So for me, my concerns are that when you screen, make sure you respond, make sure you use the right tool. I don't know which tool is going to work here. Uh, I have found different tools have yielded different things. And more often than not, that paper and your clinical interview don't always match at some times. Mm. But there is a utility in certain tools like PHQ and catching up suicidality, using the ASQ model in emergency care settings that really help as well. So that's the thing. Uh, let's uh, be very broad based with this. That's all. Mm. Thank you, Thank you so Ravi. Much, I just, Ravi. yeah. Um, I think Dr. Ravi raised a very important point, Ravi. Thank you so much for saying that because, um, you know, Sorel, what, what happens, right, in the work that we do, you know, we get a lot of invitations, right, um, to do workshops and talks. And then usually, typically, you know, let's say a corporate, they would want to do screening for their employees. And this is always our greatest concern. Uh, you know, Ravi, you're absolutely right. Every time when they want to do it, then we say, okay, we can do the screening for you, but then what if the results come out, you know, um, severe, extremely severe, then what happens? You know, are you guys going to, you know, continue giving the intervention? You know, are you guys going to pay for it? Because we need to be responsible, right, Ravi? We can't just do a mental screening and then just leave them. So this is, this is the problem. And to me, you know, what is more important really is for it to be targeted. So we need to have a targeted prevention strategy. So even if you want to do a screening, do it for uh, people that have gone through, for example, trauma or selected population like B40s. We've done that before. Um, I can just share really quickly during the first um, MCO together with uh, KWP, we did a screening for a thousand um, of our friends from the homeless uh, on the ground in, in uh, federal territory, right? So that was different. And even when we did the screening, although a thousand banya, but um, we had to really go through one by one. By one. Um, they don't really understand the questions. And then, you know, not everybody speaks the same language. So we had to have, you know, uh, volunteers that can speak Bahasa, English, and uh, Mandarin and also Tamil uh, to help them. Mm. And then via the screening that we did, you know, um, the, the our homeless friends or the folks that had, you know, severe, extremely severe results, then we had to bring them for the intervention that they needed. So this is how it needs to happen. And I think this is more um, doable and feasible in that sense, where rather than, mm. you know, mass screening for everyone, and then what happens, right? We don't mm. have that resources at the moment. So have it targeted. Um, I think that would work best. Mm. Um, thank you so much, Mananita. Um, if I can get uh, Dr. Sharifa to chime in as well, like um, if we were to conduct something like this, so something like a targeted approach, then would it be possible to involve um, community based, um, conduct more community based trainings to involve mentaries that are based there or potentially even use GPs as center points for the screenings to happen? Well, yeah, Sura, I think it is clearly uh, pointed out that community-based uh, interventions are definitely more cost-effective and also more widespread than um, inpatient or very centered hospital care. So um, I think that the way forward would be to strengthen our primary care and also the public health system in treating and also screening um, mental health cases and also interventions. Um, there's there's a lot of issues with screening. There's 
it is one of the ways to so-called detect cases. Yeah, I do agree with that. Um, but I think Dr. Ravi and Ms. Anita has correctly mentioned um, there are a lot of issues with mass screening as well. Um, the timing, the tools, uh, that means the questionnaire that you're going to use, how valid is it culturally, uh, language-wise, and um, you know, uh, in the sense of duration, do you need to repeat it? Because it, it's, it's, it's very fluid. You know, um, you may test me today and my mood would be blah, blah, blah. You test me again in another probably three weeks after some traumatic event, my mood would be blah, blah, blah. So how do you actually compare this with different populations? You know, um, if you do, you, if you want to do mass screening, right? Um, however, I do agree that there are some cases where certain uh, members of the population so-called targeted, um, that directed uh, screening would be beneficial. Maybe in certain schools, in certain um, adolescents for certain reasons and so on, or in certain sets of population, maybe someone who has been having some um, chronic illness or some very traumatic illness that caused them to have a deterioration in mental uh, health. However, I do see the advocacy of mental health literacy is very important. And I think this is some of the ways that the government should move forward, increasing mm -hmm. awareness, health literacy, and of course, outreach programs for certain groups of population. Now, um, at the moment, we don't have a, a national social insurance yet. So basically, we don't have um, a, a, a so-called uh, targeted financing system of how uh, mental health patients are going to be reimbursed or how hospitals and clinics are treating mental health is going to be reimbursed. At the moment, most of these systems are, go into the public system where most of these are either highly subsidized or very nominal payment. Of course, the wealthy can go to their private and of course, they can have a lot of access to very, very specialized care. This would be for the certain groups or maybe T20 or maybe the M40 groups. But for the B40 and things like that, I would encourage them to be enrolled. Uh, example, we have the Peke and My Salam where they go mm. into, you know, mental, uh, sorry, chronic, chronic non-communicable disease. We should include this as well as a priority for them because some of these cases do have uh, so-called mental health issues or mental health risks that we can actually, um, you know, uh, try to intervene. And another point that has been correctly mentioned is that you cannot have a mass screening and suddenly you don't know what to do with them. So this is very important to empower so-called the GPs or the primary care people or the you know uh, practitioners, uh, GPs outside, on what are the pathways that you are supposed to intervene. This is very, very, it needs very structured uh, intervention or structured protocols set by a certain fraternity. Example like COVID, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. Once your city becomes this, you need to do this and so on. And you need to go somewhere, blah, blah, blah. So this sort of uh, pathway or protocol, I know some of them are already established, but we need to strengthen because it keeps expanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mental health issues keeps expanding and you need to so-called intervene appropriately. So I think this still needs to be uh, appropriately uh, transmitted downwards. There's a lot of priority probably in the urban sector. Uh, and also there's a lot of priority in certain uh, very highly specialized institution, but we need to make sure that it reaches everybody, including the rural and also the marginalized people. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for the information. Uh, Dr. Ravi, you raised your hand for next. Yep. Um, so important point that uh, uh, Prof. Sharifa brought up, which is uh, mental health landscapes keep changing. So uh, we will probably have this discussion five years, 10 years down the road, but with different questions, questions that are answered. And there will be always, um, if you ever talk about whether we have a set goal to achieve, I don't think we will ever, the goalposts will keep moving. And that's a good thing because society changes. If we look at our policies that are five, 10, 15 years ago, they were good for that time. And now we have a new strategy. And I really like to, at this problem talking about, when you talked about all this, we have a strategy, the National Mental Health Strategy that's also uh, in enforce for 2020 to 2025, strategy aids on suicide prevention. And I think I really agree and echo with what um, this whole important thing of targeted screening. There are, uh, even in when you look at suicide rates, uh, 
even within a country, any country, I think if you are looking at countries which have very good statistics, you will suddenly see that there are some pockets of groups of people who have very high rates and low rates and across the world. Marginalized communities, refugees, migrants, prisoners, LGBTQI community, homeless, these people have high rates. And if you look at it, why? These are people who need the most, have the least access to care. So these are populations that if you can look into engaging and screening them, you will have very high yield and you can make sure that when you screen, you're not going to screen that many people. You're going to have that many, that much service so that you have that pathway to help them as well. So find people who need that and uh, to be managed that. And I really do hope uh, one day that that social insurance policy comes into place. We badly need it for healthcare across the board. That's so important. We cannot keep, uh, we, in order to be sustainable, and that's the second thing, any intervention needs to be sustainable. Bukan buat tahun ini and bye-bye next year, two years down the road, three years down the road. It needs to be something that we do and we take, keep revisiting. Every, um, if you look at NICE guidelines, if you, are, if you are in the medical fraternity, they always come, the next revision is due when. We always need to have a strategy that has uh, an expiry date, an intervention that comes with, hey, we need to sit and think of this again. We have done this well, but we need to have a think again because things change. Change is the only constant. Um, Sura, if I could just... Uh, oh, yeah, just perfect. Quickly, perfect. Uh, because, you, because you brought up the, the example of Thailand, um, hmm. we also looked at this example. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think um, uh, what's interesting about the, um, uh, the, the Thailand... So you know you have um, you have effort at all levels of society um, to to help with this um, to help with the screening process. Right? Uh, so that's I, it, it. It strengthens it strengthens the argument that um, a community based approach is very important in order to address mental health issues. However, um, to 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 just to to echo Dr. Ravi, right? Um, it, context is very important. Um, uh, Thailand, um, relatively speaking, it, with Malaysia or even like um, look at looking at Thailand as a country, right? Uh, there is there is a, a high level of homogeneity right, um, with the country. It's very different with us. Uh, we're also um, geographically not not only culturally ethnically linguistically we're also ge geographically quite diverse right mm. uh, so i guess um just 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 to quickly comment on the in our, our article on suicide decree we did actually mention thailand mm. um, i guess uh, it's it's a good sort of um uh, example as to uh, how community based approach you know can work um, and I believe that um, there is follow through as well uh, with the screenings that they do. Uh, not sure how they've done it, but uh, I, I think there is a follow through. Um, but at the same time, uh, context is, I agree, like, context is very, very important. Uh, so on the surface level, there, there are lessons to learn. Um, but at the same time, yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about very different countries. Um, even if we are neighbors, so uh, yeah. So so that that's just what I wanted to say, lah, about the Thailand uh, uh, case. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris. Yeah. Um, I think then um, what we want to move now towards is this idea of the suicide registry, and this is something that uh Malaysia has had before, and it's something that has been discontinued. But uh, what we specifically want to look at in terms of um, a future recommendation is potentially expanding this to include a self-harm registry and then making use of those targeted approaches that um, Juan Anita, Dr. Teresa, and even Dr. Ravi has mentioned on like a community-based screening level. If you have conducted the screening and then these can now be fed into a national self-harm registry and how would that look like and would something like that be helpful and could that be done in Malaysia? I would love for these registries to be there. Oh, Dr. Ravi, I can't hear you. 
Hello, am I yeah. audible? Yeah. All right, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I would love for all these registries to be in place. Uh, and uh, if you're looking at the Ireland model and you're going to if you look further into works that people are doing, there's something called an observatory system that they have there and all of that. What, why we need these registries is not that we, not that we like numbers. We are a society that's obsessed with numbers. COVID is a clear example how we were obsessed with numbers. We like the 10K, the 5K, the 15K, the 20K, the 30K, all that. We like numbers, but it doesn't tell us context. Nobody ever like, you see, we give the number, but nobody actually wants to read how many in ICU. You, know, you really need to look into that context. So we hope that when the NS firm comes into place again, we get we become as we use the information in a context base. We look at at risk groups, and uh, it's also very important here that I would like to highlight that to determine a death is by suicide takes quite a while. Huh? Nowhere we can find it very fast because there is a reason. Because when someone has been unfortunately here, probably if this is a trigger warning, I'm going to talk a bit on real context, and it might be triggering. When someone is found dead you really need to look at context, whether the person has died by accident, has died by homicide, has died by any other means of death, and all also suicide. That's why most of the time in the immediate news, it's mati mengejut, sudden death. We don't know. So this is why registries are not just merely taking counts and putting numbers. There's an investigation that goes on and then dec deciding that and all of that. So in some high-income countries, they work with this criteria of suspected suicide. And the reason why they want to really report it in real time and fast is so that postvention support after suicide is delivered to communities and you suddenly discover these pockets of community that are so much higher at risk and interventions can go in. Either way, we hope that it helps. Uh, suicide registries are helpful. Self-harm registries, on the other hand, I'm not going to say it's much more harder because self-harm rates are way higher than suicide rates and self-harm is very diverse. Self-harm doesn't present always. If you look at it, um, if you have time, go and find an, a diagram by Keith Horton that talks about an iceberg. There is so much self-harm that happens within the community that never presents. There's some that presents to services and there's some, there's very tiny bit of people who actually die by suicide, even if you look at it in a relative. Lah. So it's very hard to do it. It's not going to be easy. Neither will it, when you do registries which are presenting to services, it's going to be accurate. Uh, one of the better uh, things that you can, I mean, the things that we already have is a 2017 adolescent survey that talked about all these ideation attempts and all of that. These are things that can give you a population glance of what's actually might be going on in your community. And we should not get too alarmed by numbers. Always look at how the number was obtained and compare it with that. When the adolescent survey was released, people became so upset about it. You know, what are we doing with it? But then when you look at it, adolescents do have a higher rate of suicidal behavior in globally. But what we need to look at it is in context. In context that which, which adolescents could be more at risk. When you look at it globally, 88% of adolescent suicides happen in low and middle income country. We are an upper middle income country. So remember that. So that's where you're going to look into and you're going to look into what are the characteristics of adolescents that have suicidal behavior. And you want to see whether they are clustering in certain groups or certain types of adolescents and you want to give the targeted, going back to the same targeted thing. So great idea to bring this up, really much needed. So if we get decriminalization, uh, something that's happened, probably the next thing people will be really talking about is in the, in the field of suicide prevention and public spec spectrum is going to be the suicide registry. We do need to go there. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's something that I'm going to look at. It's, it's important to know what's happening in order for us to provide intervention. And more importantly, this is something that we really need to step up as a whole society, I mean, as, as providers and intervention givers evaluate interventions. So you have a baseline rate. So you do an intervention, you see that inter the rates go down or go up. We don't have that good number yet. What we have is, um, is good. Is, is, I'm, I'm not discounting it. Police data is good, but police data does not capture everything. It's important to know that I acknowledge, I value the numbers that are given by the police. These are what that we have. But when you have a registry, it'll be really accurate. And in order to, it'll be much more accurate and we can really see whether things work or not. Thank you so much, Dr. Pradi. Um, something that we want to pick up on with this um, self-harm registry is the idea of data privacy and the considerations that come behind it. Because I think, uh, Juanita, you mentioned earlier about the discrimination that peers already face. 
and could potentially having a self harm registry. I know ideally your data in your self harm registry should be protected, but could potentially having something like this, um, would people be deterred from even trying to join a registry as such? Yeah, I think there's there is already so much of um, stigma as as we speak, right, Sura? Um, I think you know what what is really important is whatever um, you know suicide prevention um, strategy, you know, be it you know programs like what um, Dr. Ravi mentioned earlier is um, we actually need data to be collected concurrently to the strategy being implemented because if not. Um, you know, we're not going to be able to know what needs to be prioritized, uh, what area or whom uh, needs to be given intervention. Um, and I think that that is very important. Um, I don't know much about having a national self-harm registry, uh, but uh, people that self-harm, um, it, it's not easy for them to, you know, so nobody goes around and says, um, you know, hi, I, I self-harm, you know what I mean? So I don't know how you would capture that unless they openly, you know, go to their psychiatrist and show it and, you know, that gets recorded somehow. Uh, but for someone to openly say that outside of a safe um, um, zone, I think that would be challenging, Sura. Thank you so much, Panelita. Uh, yeah, can, can I add something, Sura? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Um, in, in Malaysia, we have started what we call as the case make system. Now, the case mix system is based on DRG, Diagnostic Related Groups, and these are based on ICDs, International Classification of Diseases. Now, if we are able to quote all the admissions um, from all the inpatient care, and we have, I, I mean, not, not only, I mean, the government, the government have already the case mix system implemented in about, majority are in the so-called uh, bigger tertiary level hospitals about 10 uh, major big hospitals, but they are implementing it also in other hospitals, plus also primary care, but not, not yet, not available um, throughout Malaysia. They are doing this the coding. So in the coding system, if we are able to code this properly, we are able to detect admissions due to uh, either self-harm or parasuicide, or even you know if they have suicidal intentions, and we are able to actually digest or basically detect the whole number of people coming in with these problems. Of course, they can be the principal diagnosis or they can be secondary diagnosis. They mean they come up, they come with, let's say, fracture, but you have another diagnosis, which means that they come with self-harm or you know, uh, jumping off the stairs or things like that. So at this point in time, we are still early in this sort of um, so-called of scenario. Um, we mm -hmm. are heading towards that. In other countries, mm -hmm. what they do is that because they are the way the, the way the healthcare is being financed, maybe a bit different. We are very tax based, and most of these uh, so-called uh, services are highly subsidized by the government through tax. Eh? But other countries, they have gone into this, this so-called the social insurance or some sort of insurance where they have to reimburse the hospital or the healthcare that actually provides services to these patients. So they have mm -hmm. to go through the DRG or the case mix and they mm -hmm. are able to so-called way uh, or able to detect the, the prevalence of people going into self-harm or parasuicide or things like that. At the moment, if we are going to have a, a suicidal registry, which we had eh, and, and this continued, and if let's say we are to revive that or even a self-harm registry, I think this has to be to the, on the hands of the providers. That means it has to be in the hands of the healthcare providers or, or even the primary care or whoever is looking after the patients, then they have to actually put these patients under the registry. It means we detect, we detect them. It, it's good if we are able to do that. Uh, of course, um, I think we have to solve the, the uh, individual act and things like that because somebody would say that, you know, I don't want my name to be there and things like that, yeah. and, uh, consent yeah. and so on. So um, there are other things in play, but if we are going to have all the case mix or, or so-called the ICDs, we can actually code um, these admissions if they are admitted into the hospitals or if they are seen in the primary care. Um, it is still ongoing. So that's something that uh, may happen in the future, Sura, just for uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharifa. It's good to hear that there's some um, there's progress currently being made and you know what we can do ahead as well. Um, now we'll like to move forward to the um, next point. That is the training and empowerment of first-time respondents. So we spoke about how um, 
the care is and how people, the different pathways that people are brought into uh, the hospital to receive mental health support. And sometimes it involves uh, paramedics and sometimes it may involve even police and firemen. So um, something that we've noticed when we were doing our research is that, first of all, WHO has already created a resource for first-line responders under its worldwide initiative for suicide prevention. And there's also some guidelines by MOH. But um, we wanted to just also hear from uh, the panel as to whether based on your experiences, is this something that our frontline responders actually practice um, besides the paramedics, so specifically the policemen and the firemen, and based on the experiences, um, Juan Anita as well, like with lived experiences, um, is this something that the peers have experienced to be, um, that they are, sorry, that, that they are brought in based on these guidelines as well, so that the first line respondents actually adhere to these guidelines, and whether in terms of training with any um, policemen that you've um you've had uh good sessions with dr ravi uh whether you know if they've received the proper training to actually recognize signs of mental illnesses and deciding on what uh actions to take based on this um could i open the floor up to one and either dr ravi first and then we can keep from that uh we have given um I, I wouldn't say training, Sura, but more of a awareness talks to, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, the police force, right? Um, and there is a lot of, um, I, I mean, I, I don't really want to single out police, but what I'm trying to say is there's there's a lot of stigma across the board, right? Um, so when we did the um, awareness talks, um, you know, with them, they, they've said a lot of things as well. And um, I think for me, for Miasa, it's always an opportunity to educate um, because when, when people don't understand, then that is why um, support is um, harder to give, right? It's, it's difficult to provide when you don't understand. Um, and I think it was a big um, eye opener for us, um, especially when uh, we worked a lot with um, BBKL, JKM, um, PDRM, ATM, um, JPOM, um, RELA, where uh, many of them had really poor knowledge on uh, mental health. So many of the people that they were um, trying to help um, were um, stigmatized when they were actually when they actually had to provide the help. So I think that was a very, um, very, very to be honest, a very sad experience for Miasa uh, when that happened. Um, so I think that we really need, need to push for training, especially when these are the people that um, are supposed to help and um, be friendly um, in that sense. So our services that we're currently providing for peers are not that friendly um, in that sense, Sura. But I think this is, mm. um, you know, generally um, the level of knowledge uh, that we're seeing uh, across, across the board um, right now. Mm. I have thanks experienced sort of, sorry, thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. Yeah, but I feel, Ravi, I feel so bad saying that, but it's just an honest experience yeah. that we went through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, actually, I think, you know, what's important here is that it's important to recognize gaps. As we said, the goalpost keeps moving and the thing that yeah. goes yeah. up. And I think yeah. uh, with working with police, which I have done recently this year, we did training with police. And there's so much that is expected from the men in, uh, in force and especially the firemen and police as well. So what mm -hmm. we really do need to help is to start working with them rather yes. than saying that this is a problem and leave with that. And we have done engagement work and it's really important. And it's not just about one-off trainings. It has to be sustainable. Definitely. And important, another important thing is supporting police when, you are, when they are trying to help people in crisis. And this is uh, anecdotally, I'm going to share that once there was a person in crisis who was really, really, really ill and we had to get our EMT team working with EMT is the emergency, the paramedic team with the police force to work with. And we had, and that's where, where we were able to, uh, that's when you probably would need specialized care to actually give that consultation to work with the police. And so there's, uh, so we were working with them to actually bring this person to safety and it worked very, and it worked well. And that is where I see there is a, the, this thing, uh, there's a gap and uh, there's a gap that can be filled. So there's many gaps to fill. One of that is uh, cases that probably need 
tech support, and then they are looking at bigger trainings and sustainable trainings. And police are actually very, they're very keen to engage if you are willing to provide the training and support as well. And here I'd like to highlight something that we have, and not, not only we have engaged with police and started working um, with them, I, I come from very limited state and regional experience. I've also, it's also important to recognize that uh, we also need to skip police and firemen support. Working with suicidal clients or people who have suicidal experience or mental health crises is not easy. It can trigger people as well. It can remind people of their own lived experience. Uh, police are also human beings. Firemen are also human beings. Paramedics are human beings. So are people who with professionals. Uh, you do not know the lived experience background and the difficulties in working in such situations. So when we talk about training and empowerment of frontline officers, more needed, new things to work with them is also new ways to work with them is also important. And you've got to look at it in a way that you're helping them to do their job better and helping them to, you have to listen to them what they need and provide that training. And also important to look at how are they affected and providing them the necessary supports as well. So this is probably something that we need to be looking into. And I'm quite sure that's something that's being looked into at the moment as well. And, and, and also the other thing, Ravi, is also um, increasing mental health vocabulary. You know what I mean? Um, this is also very important. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I think there's a lot of judgment as well. Um, the, the mindset needs to shift as well um, when you're helping a person um, that is in crisis for sure. Um, I think this is this keeps on being the challenge because yeah. now you have you know now you have a certain uh, mental health uh, understanding, uh, but then does it really translate into attitude and behavior, Ravi? That's that's the part that we are really, not seeing. Yeah, that's really really important. Even uh, yeah. to the extent uh, uh, you know, I like to share that you know if we are looking at uh, uh, looking at things like. Um, how do you respond to someone? You know, there's so many things, you know, that I, I, I'm just reflecting on services. How does someone answer the telephone when somebody's calling in crisis? How does someone behave to someone who comes to triage? How does someone behave when someone is in this thing? I, I had a very good conversation with my EP. My EP says, I take in anybody who comes in because I may not never know. I, I take in anyone who comes in because we were engaging in part of producing a, an access video for World Mental Health Day because I said we were trying to look into improving access. So we're making a local video for the local community. One of the things they said, the, the thing is I asked like, how do you actually triage, you know, do you say some people go to the clinic, go to, you know, divert them? Uh, my EP said, like, from her experience, when you work with heterogeneous population, uh, diversion may not be a really good idea because people will not come, in, come to the emergency department and say, I am suicidal. It's mm. hard to say that. It's very hard. Try, even, even if, if you look at it in crisis, it's very hard to say that I'm not okay. Even though we keep telling people, it's not easy to tell that, let alone to a stranger. So that's why they take in anybody who comes in, you know, they say that. And so that uh, we also look into, you do, we do need to put in systems uh, where we actually audit our systems, whether, whether our service, but actually this is where more empowerment, more way to look into is it's, it's, it's multifactorial. You know, you have to look, you want to capture something, uh, you need to like put the lens, uh, you need to put the camera, like how cameras capture cooking shows in so many angles in order for it to become good, like, you know, the best cooking shows have close-ups, have far-ups, have people talking to you. You need to capture this in the lens of the provider, have to capture it in the lens of the user. You also have to capture in the, the, the lens of the evaluator. So we have that, then probably we can do better training and empowerment. Just something that came about. Yep, yep. And, and also just to mention, since that we're an NGO, that NGOs on the ground are stretched very thin as well. Uh, you know, and we're trying our best to ease the burden of the mental health system. Uh, Juga, uh, just to give you an insight, um, from August last year until August 2nd this year, we have received 96,000 people reaching out for the help. Just imagine, um, you know, to do that. So we have our crisis team, you know, which uh, man the phone lines and also uh, they're able to mobilize themselves so they can go to uh, the person in crisis on site. Um, people reaching out via WhatsApp, uh, via um, social media, especially, um, and also emails. 
uh, and virtual sessions. I think one of the biggest um, silver linings as well is telehealth right now. Um, so we're able to break that barrier to access somewhat um, as well um, at the moment. Um, so NGOs need need a lot of support and, and funding <laughs> juga to be able to sustain uh, what we're doing at the moment. Hmm. If I can even say that, we must make sure we are also training the right people. Uh. Sometimes people who get invited for trainings are probably people who are not doing the groundwork or doing that. So we have to exactly. have account accountability to who gets trained. And this is across the board of training. I think I have, most of the time, you we also need to ask whether people are interested to attend the training. Suicide prevention is not something that everybody will can be willing to do because people have lived experience and you might want to get close to that because you need to look after your own safety. So I remember recently when we had a discussion on a certain training that we are doing, uh, we asked them, genuinely asked them whether they want to come for the training. This is what we have to offer. We rather train few who are effective rather than many than this thing. I really think Prof Sharifa can talk about all this because she's, she probably has is more experience in rolling out big interventions for people. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. But then um, I, I just want to say that you, you everyone's uh, correctly pointed out that the resource is very important. Uh, for, for me personally, I think that, um, if, example, eh, you have somebody on the ledge. Let's say this person is like trying to jump down eh, and the first person would be either the police or maybe bomber or, you know, some, some random people. And sometimes when you, and, and these people, are unfortunately, sometimes may not be the right person to talk to so-called the victim. <laughs> they might actually push the victim over pun. So sometimes we call people who are eligible, that means people who are trained, and this takes time. This is why we need to train more people, the either the police or the firemen or things like that. But um, it, it needs to come, the order needs to come from above. It's not, we can't just say, oh, I want to do a training on you all. Like, can, can you all help me to, um, you know, put out or, or, or settle this problem on mental health issues. Some of them would not be eligible or just would not listen because this is not the boss order. You know, it has to mm -hmm. also come direction, must also come from above. That means, you know, from the government, from MKN or, you know, or, or from, from someone who is, um, who, who are, you know, in, in this area saying that, okay, we need to work together with the healthcare as well to be trained as a first line respondents because we have a lot of mental health issues. And, and this is very good. I think this is something that everyone should work through. I, I think that uh, we should be training as much people as possible because doctors and healthcare are sometimes are not the first person to, to manage these cases. Mm -hmm. They might be the police, they might be the bomber, they might be just random people, um, you know, e-hailers or grab drivers, they are usually everywhere, again. <laughs> so they must also be trained in some way, in some way. So people, not only literacy, but also, um, you know, training must come um, to a lot of people, more, pe more people. But I think the directive should come from above. That means it has to be coming from the government, some sort of uh, policy or incentive for certain people. If you are trained as a first line responder, you are trained in psychological first aid and things like that. This is very good. So I, I think because of the a lot of uh, example, the earthquake and things like that in certain countries, we are trained in psychological first aid. But mm -hmm. how do we actually um, come up or basically how we interact with people who are trying to take their lives, you know? So this needs more work. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Professor Sharifa, um, and thank you to the panelists for just um, you know, discussing these different recommendations. Uh, what we want to do before we close is actually just uh, peel out other ideas that may not have already been in the discussion. So that we have spoken about training and we've spoken about community-based care, but there's so many other ways that suicide prevention um can be done. And something that was also important that I think uh Dr. Chan mentioned in the comments is the importance of supporting healthcare workers as well to prevent burnout. So we'd like to listen more about these different ideas that we may not have discussed about or that we didn't include on slides to talk about and before we close. So I just want to open up the floor back again to anyone who wants to touch on different ideas that we may not have discussed. Mm. 
maybe I can start, Sura? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the things um, that I've seen from the work that we do is um, a lot of a lot of our peers that battle suicidal thoughts and um, ideation have depression and um, people with that depression typically they want to isolate themselves um, and one of the ways that this can be improved is when they make themselves useful right. Um, so social connectedness, uh, being engaged in meaningful um, activities or work, etc. One of the things that we see lacking in Malaysia is actually social holdings uh, for people in this category, right? Um, so I feel that um, even at Nyasa, you know, we have an activity center, crisis management center, but if we're able to have more social holdings where, you know, peers can go to, because where do we see um, you know, uh, people with disabilities or people with mental health disorders, a lot of it, a lot of us in clinical settings, rehab centers, but we don't necessarily have other places where can, we can really engage uh, meaningfully in that sense. So maybe um, to minimize the cost, uh, what can happen is we have a lot of uh, community um, centers uh, across the mm -hmm. nation. That are probably underutilized. Can Sura sometimes when I drive past, I I, I see two cars maybe or none. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe if we can convert those places into you know social holdings, people can interact, can come in, have a drink, you know, engage with other mm -hmm. peers. For example, I think that would be uh, really beneficial so that people have a way to at least you know go out and interact um, socially. I think that would be important. So lack of social holdings is probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, something that we've seen and we can um, actually provide that. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's, yeah, I think that is definitely an interesting addition to the stuff that we've been discussing and it's that peer support, right, is very um, important in just the victims getting better over time as well. Definitely, because that is, you know, the, the camaraderie, you know, yeah. uh, having you, you're able to relate to one another, um, you know, there's a sense of hope, uh, there's a way out because you can share your experiences. Um, and then there is uh, empowerment, of course, uh, empowering one another and then growing, uh, you know, uh, via these uh, meaningful relationships um, and, and strength uh, that you tumpang lah kan from each mm. other the beginning. I think it's very, very important. Mm. Thank you. Um, Sura, can, can I come in? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just, yeah. just to uh, follow on follow up on what Fonalita has said. La, um, so one of the things that we found in our mental health research is, um, and it's, it's also, again, it's not something that's un as a result of the pandemic. I'm sorry, uh, could, could I get you to repeat the sentence? Uh, so social isolation is something that we need to keep in mind as a result of the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, people people work remotely. Um, uh, all of a sudden, it happened, um, and, and it's not just it's not just the adults who are working, right? I I I, I used to be an academic, and uh, I had the opportunity to um, to look um, after um, uh, pastoral care in my school, uh, and uh, as the pandemic began, uh, you 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 need to think of ways to actually to actually um, provide um, support to students as they actually start to learn remotely, right? Um, they're, 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 they're scattered everywhere. So you need to think of ways to actually, um, even at that level, right? Um, we're talking mental health here, um, not, not, not touching on, on, on suicide prevention, uh, 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 that level. Uh, just to make sure that uh, we can sort of um, 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 we can provide um, um, at the very least moral sort of support um, mm -hmm. um, to people, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that will have to be uh, looked into is um, um, social spaces. And mm -hmm. getting people to getting people to to come together, uh, and of course uh, to cultivate a sense of to get uh, a sense of togetherness, it, it'll go a long way. But if I could just uh, just just very quickly to, uh, of course we've covered a lot of stuff already, right? Uh, these, we have to destigmatize. We need to educate. Um, we need to 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 educate the society more about um, the importance of um, uh, mental health um, and looking after um, um, 
um, one another. Um, I guess on a higher level, um, there is also um, the need um, for um, especially the economic fallout that, that has come alongside the pandemic, right? Because um, a lot of what's happened um, in the past um, uh, year and a half or so has been um, 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 things like uh, um, loss of income amongst people, downward mobility, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, all things that we were not ready for um, as the pandemic came. Um, and it's how we as a society, the government, is, the government of course, but we also as a society respond to all these uh, issues um, that will define the way we, we go forward because uh, mm -hmm. post -pandemic, the post-pandemic future is there to be shaped, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be tough and it's, it's uh, whatever fallout that we, we see now is going to stay with us for, for, for quite some time. So yeah. um, addressing, um, addressing um, all these um, social factors, uh, addressing, um, addressing uh, on, 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 a, on a higher level, right? Um, mm -hmm. What kind of economic policies are we going to put in place? What kind of assistance will there be? Um, material assistance. Um, so it's not just about um, 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 it's not just about support. Um, it's not just about um, um, mental or uh, spiritual support and so on. But um, the, the material side of things as well is very very important. So it's 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 something that you know that that's a challenge lah um, going yeah. forward. Um, yeah. Thank you, Doctor Karen. Um, I just want to let the speakers know so we're going to end in about five minutes but some final thoughts dr ravi yep um, i think what we are speaking about have been spoken about really good stuff uh, let's look at ways we can go forward and how we what we can do and what we should be able to do suicide prevention has to look at its causation which is complex there are individual social society systemic factors there's so many things there there's so many roles that we can do, uh, limiting access to lethal means to so many other things, interactions with media, um, how you real resilience in young people, as well as how do you help people to get early care. So in the subject of decriminalization, I really would urge organizations like your cell, your organization, to team up with all the many youth mental health organizations that we just came up about this two years, a lot of growth. Didn't have them when I five years ago. Didn't have uh, certainly we don't know, don't even know the NGO word 10, 15 years ago, but now you guys are there. Use this opportunity to talk to people who might not be actually interested to attend this kind of forums. We talk about people who are already interested, people who are already on board with the cause. Try to get try to engage with people who may never get this opportunity or who have a lot of power who may not get this information. I'm talking about people like use your platform to talk to parliamentarians and not just parliamentarians who are interested. There are a lot of parliamentarians who may not have talked about this. Talk to those parliamentarians. Talk to parliamentarians. Uh, they want to add add-ons in places where they are not city centers and roads, they are also part of Malaysia. It's important to understand that Malaysia is big, Malaysia is complex, Malaysia needs, if you need a country, you need to have to get everyone together in order to get this thing done. It's not just about a half word. It's important that we don't just hit enough majority to go into, if you're looking at parliament levels, you need to look at suicide prevention as a collective you need to look at very high levels of engagement because then only it will trickle down. As I think I'm really echoing, you want to talk about whether governments or parliaments or countries make decisions, you need to get all of them on board. So I hope that if you want to take something as a take home, try coming up with an initiative where you talk to most of these parliamentarians. It's going to be very tough to get their time. It's exceptionally tough. Try doing that. It's exceptionally tough, but it's possible. Give them mm -hmm. info. Tell them about what's evidence. Tell them what good this will do for their constituents. That will be something that I think I'll just hope that you guys take up. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. Um, Dr. Sharifa, any final thoughts before we close? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I think that besides uh, our healthcare and also um, the supporters of that, the system also needs to look at schools. Because the nation, our National Health Mobility Survey has mentioned that some of the biggest issues, including our children because of cyberbullying, the, the 4IR and things like that, 
Um, so that means teachers needs to be trained as well because they are the so-called the primary care in the schools as well, school system. Thank you. Mm. Yep. Thank you, um, Dr. Shaifa. I just want to thank the panel again for all of the insights and for this really, really good discussion um, on decriminalizing suicide and also suicide prevention. I think everyone in the um, audience really appreciated all of this. I just want to let everyone know that uh, because MSGA is a global organization, so we actually had like participants that were from different countries. And that's why you may have seen people popping in and popping out because people were from different time zones. So I'm currently in London and I saw some people that were coming in from the US and so everyone's in different time zones and people are like at, it's 2 a.m. in some places as well. So thank you everyone for your time.